Who do we have on the telephone lines? Can't open the phone from one mic, but I can do. Wendy McPherson? Wendy, welcome. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's our pleasure, Wendy. Uh, who else do we have? Peter? Uh, I'm here too, uh, Jeff. Welcome, Peter. No, it's David. David. It's, it's David. <laughs> Changing voices. Yeah, you're, you're sounding like Peter now. Peter Garrow, are you there? Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to call to order the regular public meeting, January 28th, 2015. And I'll ask all of us to rise for the team of Old Canada. <laughs> The director to do a roll call, please. Trustee Arnold? Here. First Vice Chair Karkner? Present. Trustee Cram? Present. Trustee Garrow? Uh, Trustee McPherson, Bill? Present. Trustee Wendy McPherson? Here. Trustee McAllister? Present. Second Vice Chair McDonald? Present. Chair McMillan? Present. Trustee Richards? Present. Trustee Swan. Student Trustee Shayla Cruz. Present. Thank you very much. Uh, there is an, ad, uh, an amendment to the agenda. I am uh, removing item 6.02, the capture rate strategy from uh, this particular agenda. We'll move it forward to the next uh, meeting. Uh, so I need a motion that the Upper Canada District School Board approve the um, Consent agenda, the amended consent agenda with the removal of point 602 capture rate strategy. Moved by Trustee McPherson, seconded by Trustee McAllister. I ask you to cast your votes, please. I apologize, but I'm having some difficulty. I assume you approve of that, though, Trustee? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, I assume, uh, Lisa, I'm having a difficult time getting the screen to work. Excellent. But I have it now. So, uh, okay, that carries. Uh, are there any conflict of interest? Seeing there are none, I need a motion that the Upper Canada District School Board move into Committee of the Whole for discussion on agenda items 5.02. 6.04, moved by Trustee Karkner, seconded by Trustee Richards. Cast your votes, please. Again, I'm having problems logging in. I apologize, but I... <laughs> no problem at all. Okay, we're moving forward on the agenda that, that carries. The uh, first item that we have on the agenda is I'd like to uh, personally welcome Dr. Paula Student, uh, Stewart, our Medical Officer of Health and uh, Lois Dewey. And uh, I'm asking, I believe, uh, Dr. Paula Stewart, you're coming forward to doing the presentation. So welcome. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here. If I, am I doing this right? Here we go. 
You're good? Okay. Um, we do so much work between the school board and the health unit that I'm delighted to be able to come and share some of the work that we've been doing. Um, David Coombs has been involved with the Healthy Community Partnership really since its beginning and has been a wonderful supporter of the work. So I'm here as chair of the Healthy Communities Partnership. Um, in my role as Medical Officer of Health, as your role, you do a lot of administrative things, a lot of things, finance, so on. This is the one project that I'm involved in that fuels my passion for creating a healthy community. So I'm delighted to come and share it with you today. What I want to talk about is the healthy community vision. For the last three or four years, the partnership that includes municipalities, community health centers, um, the Heart and Stroke Foundation, really people like me who care passionately about the, about the community and believe that by working together we can make a difference. One of the things we did early on is went to the community and to community organizations and said, what's important to you about a healthy community? And out of that, we created the healthy community vision and the document that we're going to talk about today. So this is this hasn't been made in Toronto, this hasn't been made in Winnipeg or Ottawa. This is Atlanta, Cleese and Granville that we're going to talk about. What they said to us is that a healthy community is a place where there are healthy people in Atlanta, Cleese and Granville who live, learn, work and play in healthy communities. So so often we say that people make individual choices, which is absolutely true. But our motto is, we have to make the healthy choice the easy choice. So it's not just about informing people about what's good for them. What can we do in terms of the environments that we create that will encourage people to make the healthy choices? My grandkids go to Queen Elizabeth School in Perth. They have an outdoor, I don't know what it's called, an outdoor classroom, David, or my grandkids get to get outside on a regular day while they're at school and they get to sit and learn and play in an outdoor environment with nature and we know the huge impact that has. That is what creating healthy environments is all about, whether it's trails, whatever it is. It's the environment that people live in so that the healthy choice is the easy choice. So there are six components that we've um, included in the healthy community vision. The first one is physical activity. Um, I emphasize being outdoors in nature in this one. Um, the, the board was incredibly supportive of the, um, um, the big event that we put on at the end of September, um, Nature for Life, because um, we know the profound impact that being in nature and learning in nature has on children. So that's the first one, physical activity. And you guys do a ton of work about promoting physical activity. The second one is about healthy eating. And the critical thing here is that healthy community members have access to healthy food. It's not just, it's partly about choice, but it's also about access. The breakfast programs that you um, support in your schools are a critical component of making sure that kids come to school um, and are, are ready and able to learn with, with a full tummy. The third one is mental well-being and resili resiliency. And I know you're doing a lot of work around um, resiliency. Um, and um, we know the profound impact that mental health has on kids learning and, and I know you're doing a lot on that as well. Substance and alcohol misuse and prevention. Um, I know that there's work around safe grads. Um, this is something which is important to you guys as well. And if we all as a community work on this, we have a greater chance that, um, that our kids will use um, substances and alcohol appropriately and not misuse them. <coughs> Tobacco use, I love the little thing um, that he said, no smoking in the park. We've been working with you for a long time. Thank you. We've been working with you for a long time um, to create um, smoke-free spaces and the provincial government has recently passed new legislation that um, people aren't going to be able to smoke in parks either where kids are playing, which is really important. And the last one is on injury prevention. And I know David's going to be talking about a concussion policy. Um, the way we work together is that uh, with Tanya Boilo, we're looking at how we support your work around the concussion policy by working with healthcare providers. So it's all of us working together. And the purpose of the vision is that we name that these are things that are important to all of us and we collectively work toward them. So what I'm going to ask you to do tonight is think about endorsing the community vision, um, along with lots of other people who've already done it. Um, healthy communities are vibrant, they're connected to each other. We know that. We've got tons of examples in Lanark, Lees, and Granville. We can all do something to support healthy choices. Um, and it's, it's only if we intentionally think about it, how do we create the healthy environments that we can um, help our communities do that. 
you know very well how important a healthy community is for learning, growth, and development. Our residents say they want to live in a healthy community. We have an obligation to respond to them. Huge economic benefits for the, um, um, for the community. When I'm speaking to municipalities, I really emphasize this a lot. Um, less absenteeism, more innovation, less use of the healthcare system. And the healthcare system is facing a crisis because um, chronic illness is what's really pushing demands on the system. And yet all the things I listed, the six things, if we all did those things, we wouldn't have to use the healthcare, healthcare system. Working together makes change happen, change happen. And it's all about building momentum in the community. Lots of other people have already endorsed it. We've gone to the United Counties. We are systematically going around to every municipality. And every time Lois and I go there, and there's always a councillor who tells us the wonderful stories they're doing in their municipality to support it and members of the public. <laughs> We're also working with municipalities to do um, an asset inventory um, so that we can help them make healthy choices about um, their policies. So in short, together we can make a difference. By signing the, the endorsing the, part, the uh, vision, you're saying as a board that you believe in it. Um, the, we were just talking before the meeting that the uh, Ministry of Education's new um, healthy schools framework is totally fits in with all this. It's like we're all in the head, same headspace together. Um, so we're going, to, we're going to show you a video now that we made um, um, here locally that really describes what we're talking about. So let's see if I can do this. Wait for the hand, push on it. One day, some time ago, people were very active in their everyday lives. They worked hard to produce and preserve their own food. Neighbors were valued and cherished. They made their own clothing and even built their own homes. If they had to go somewhere, and they didn't usually go far, they walked or hitched up their horses to draw carts, plows, buggies, or sleighs. People depended on each other to help with the big jobs, such as harvest time or barn raising. But one day, things became more complicated. People no longer only worked on their farms or in their own communities. They had to drive great distances to find employment to support their families. They didn't have time to make their own meals. They bought their processed food at the grocery store, or their food came in a paper bag through a window. Parents drove their children to school and anywhere else they needed to go. Activities were organized as they saw their community as a dangerous place. Screen and fingertip communication replaced the neighborly visit. People grew more sedentary and stress levels increased. Chronic diseases became much more common, even affecting children. For the first time in history, children were expected to live shorter lives than their parents. People's tastes changed and they began to prefer sweet, salty and fatty foods. Relationships between people suffered as they became more isolated and distrusting. The people realized things needed to change. They wanted a better future for themselves and for their children. They began to recognize the importance of healthy living. They wanted to see healthy people in Lanark, Leeds and Grenville who live, learn, work and play in healthy communities.
They wanted parks to play in, nature trails to wander, facilities for sports, and sidewalks so they could walk safely to school, to work, or to shop. They wanted community gardens and farmers markets where they could grow or produce locally grown food. Individuals, groups, and organizations worked together to make their communities healthy communities. The people became more active, happier, and ate nutritious foods that tasted delicious. People met each other in the parks and while out walking. They got to know people from other generations and cultures and enjoyed spending time with them. The downtown core revitalized as people dropped in to shop and visit. They valued nature again. Farms were thriving and sustainable. Companies from across Canada and beyond heard about the healthy communities in Lanark, Leeds and Grenville and came to see what was happening. They found places where they could live healthy lives and chose those communities for relocation. Everyone realized the difference it makes to live in a healthy community where all community members have the opportunity to make healthy choices. To live in a healthy environment that promotes well-being and quality of life. And that is why all the community members are so glad that they live in Lanark, Leeds and Grenville. This story is still in the development stage. We have begun our journey towards healthy communities, but there is still work to be done and collaborating, innovating, and co-creating to do. We each have a contribution to make. Please consider this your invitation to join or continue on the journey towards our healthy community. You'll notice the reference to school travel planning and the board has been wonderfully supportive of all the work to getting kids active on the way to, to and from school. So that's it, thank you. I, I encourage you to endorse it, to join all the rest of us in working on it together. Thank you very much. Comments or questions? Trustee McPherson. Uh, through the chair. Um, it was recently announced the, the launching of the Two Rivers Food Hub in Smith Falls. Does this tie into that concept? Like, um, are they part of this movement, so to speak? Yeah. Um, through the chair, absolutely. Um, you'll notice that healthy eating was um, um, a critical part of it. And um, I've been involved in that right from the very beginning. That's exactly what we're talking about. When we recognize that healthy eating and supporting our local farmers is part of it, then it's all working together. So um, there, um, the, that, that project is a really good example of how the community can come together um, to create healthy communities. Yeah, it's wonderful. Christy Carter. Thank you for your presentation. It indeed was informative and we're very grateful to have you in the Leeds, Grenville and Lanark area pushing this forward into the communities. Um, I just wanted to know if you've touched base with your counterpart in SDNG and Prescott Russell. Um, uh, there are a lot of little programs going on in, in the different areas in uh, those five counties. Um, but I just wondered, have you connected with him to uh, share what you've done and if he's willing to endorse it as well and be part, bring it to the other part of the board. Yeah. Um, Paul Remediotis and I have a very close relationship. He's the medical officer out there. And so I told him I was coming here because we share you guys. <laughs> um, each community approaches developing healthy communities a little bit differently. Um, he knows what we're doing. He has a copy of the vision. Um, our steering committee felt that it was important that we sort of name what a healthy community is and and encourage people to be part of it. I think they've taken a different approach there. Um, I'm gonna be meeting with them in about a week and a half, and so we'll be talking to him more, because he wants to hear more about what we've done. Um, so I, I think it's a very good point. I, I would love it if everyone across Ontario did this. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Tristan McAllister. Thank you, uh, Dr. Stewart, for your presentation. Um, I noticed that I, I, I certainly, personally, I endorse uh, the six or the five or six factors that you identified as integral to the uh, to the vision, and I noticed also that it aligns very well with the uh, the document from the Ministry of 
of Ontario, which is Achieving Excellence, a renewed vision for education in Ontario. And one of those uh, goals is promoting well-being, which we are trying to do and you are trying to do. I guess um, one of the concerns that I have um, is you represent the communities in, um, in Lanark, Leeds, and Grenville. We represent all of the communities in Upper Canada. How can we, just further to your question, I guess, uh, Trustee Carter, is how can we and how can you, because we have a mandate for the whole board, how can we pursue this goal? I think, um, taking your advice, I think the, um, I'm meeting with Paul another week and a half, and so I'll share with him what we're doing. And when I emailed him the information and we chatted briefly, he was really curious to know more about it. Um, I, I, I thought a lot about that, because you're in an awkward position. It says Leonard Cleese in Grenville, but in fact you're for the whole area. There's nothing in there. I think that the Eastern Health Unit would not agree with, and I, I can say that 100%. So I think by endorsing it here um, and saying that you're committed to it for the whole community, I don't think that contravenes anything that's happening in Eastern Ontario. And I think it, it's really important that we do things together. Uh, when, uh, when we have meetings with the directors from both boards, we do it together. So I'll work hard with Paul to try and get him to think about this as well, because it, it would be nice. Supplementary, if I could. Um, I, I have a supplementary question to you, Dr. Stewart. You uh, mentioned uh, the uh, school travel planning, and I know that uh, Superintendent Coombs and his staff have been very active in, in helping you promote this and working with you. Um, how can the uh, school travel planning? initiatives be tied into our schools and our board as part of this vision? How can, how can we do more on this one? And what can we do as a board? Yeah, um, I might leave David to answer that. Um, I, I, the, the principals who have lent their leadership this, about this have been phenomenal. Um, they've, they've, they've been incredible. So I'll leave it with David to, to suggest how the board could help further. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, uh, school travel planning um, has been uh, an initiative uh, which has been, um, we've been a, uh, a very grateful partner of for the past couple of years and started out at Westminster Public School here in Brockville. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, point out Suzanne Rivard, who is the chair of our PIC committee, um, was a uh, um, uh, really led this initiative to, to go forward um, and and uh, as Dr. Stewart has mentioned um, where we have done we've expanded it out to municipalities and schools that have been anxious to receive us so we've been working with the coalition of the willing uh, and I know that we have more um, uh, we have more communities and schools that are anxious to get on board with this um, the uh, the challenge to that will be um, sustaining it from a, from a resource standpoint um, and what I mean by that is um, there does need to be some kind of coordination moving forward to uh, help um, uh, new municipalities and uh, schools learn from uh, the schools which are currently um, uh, currently undergoing uh, this, this initiative. Um, so we do have some uh, discussions in place with the uh, healthy partners and uh, with Dr. Stewart and with other partners in, in uh, Eastern Ontario. Um, <coughs> so I, I, I see it as really an integral part of our wellness um, uh, wellness initiative, uh, and and believe that it's going to be uh, uh, it's going to pay dividends both in healthy children and student achievement going forward. Dr. Stewart, what would your interpretation of that be? What David just said? Yes. Thrilled. From from a health from a your yeah. Health. I, I, I'll tell you a little anecdote. We were all Westminster School when you started this. What was it? Two years ago now. And um, we walked with the grade five students, I think, um, from the school down the road and up um, to the Y. 
and it was I was standing at the back and to watch the kids talking with each other, leaning over the bridge and looking at the ducks in the river, talking about the trees, like it was phenomenal. They were alive, they were energized. From a health point of view, there's a ton of research that supports that kids that are active on the way to school, particularly if they're active through parks and through trees and so on, are, are ready set to learn. My granddaughter sit on the bus for 45 minutes, arrive at Queen Elizabeth School and sit on the bus until the bell goes. Um, that, that, there's so much more that could be done. And as David said, it's really, it's really about the, the school community, because it's not just the principal, it's the police. Like, w we walked with the police. It's the whole community that has to come together to, to support this. Um, the, the school buses, everything. From a health point of view, it makes a huge difference. From a developmental point of view, it makes a huge difference. There's a lot of research to support that. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to, uh, um, to, to um, add to that, uh, initially when Suzanne and, and Tanya came to see me a couple of years ago with this proposal, um, uh, like a lot of initiatives, I said, well, sounds good, but we're really busy. Um, <laughs> I, I really, you know, I, I would need some research saying this actually has a really good impact upon student wellness and achievement. And they said, fair enough. And they came back in a couple of weeks with a lot of research from around the world, uh, both in Canada, Australia, England, um, saying that this actually has a, uh, a, a, a positive impact, not just on student wellness, but student achievement, yeah. actual um, uh, actual academic achievement in the uh, grades. That got my attention, and, and since then, it's been a very fruitful partnership. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Trustee McAllister, I can tell. I, I, I'm just concerned about how we are going to sustain, when I say we, I mean you and us, how we are going to sustain this important initiative. Okay, further comments, questions? I have something, if I may. Uh, yeah, go, sure. ahead, go ahead, Trustee McPherson. I'm, I'm not quite sure if now is the time to address this sort of issue, or, but I was um, curious about uh, if we adopt this healthy living uh, would there be anything maybe change in this might actually go through you chair to to um, Mr. Coombs uh, with regards to having students um, no longer sitting and waiting on buses in the morning I know um, as a parent when I was on the PTA it was often brought up that the students were waiting on the buses uh, and I mean, we remember back when we were students where we had that time before class started to be off the bus and playing around and and, and um, would we be going looking at that at all uh, as possibility to encourage this healthy way of living? I think I think Trustee McPherson that certainly is a valid point but I, I, I don't want to bring it into the discussion right now okay? But fine enough thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments questions? Trustee McPherson? The other. The other Trustee McPherson. Uh, when um, you talked about uh, physical activity, I believe the board has a policy on half an hour a day of active physical activity. Um, I just want to re-mention a program that was running at one of my schools called Walk and Talk. And every day at the quarters of three, the entire school would go out on the playground, weather permitting, and walk the perimeter of the playground and they would do that for half an hour and the purpose of one was to get exercise B was to talk to your friends and the principal wasn't very popular at the time but he said no iPods no electronic devices all that stays in the school and it was an amazing process you pop along there to pick up the kids, and they would all be doing the perimeter. And uh, so, when you mentioned walk and talk, that brought back that to my mind. Thank you, Trustee McPherson. Thank you so much, oh, Trustee McAllister. Would it be in order to uh, move a motion? You can move a motion, or what I was going to suggest is that we. Uh, refer this matter uh, to the administration for a follow-up and a follow-up discussion. I think it, it just seems to me that 
Uh, we certainly are 100% behind the plan in terms of having healthy communities. There's just a few things that, because we represent such a vast area that uh, I think we need to have a little more clarity on in terms of our role and what we're doing as on the board. Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead. I support your um, your thought process about uh, having a go back to staff. I think um, the, the fact that we may support some some of the concepts, some of the ideology of of uh, healthy students, uh, we need to understand how things are embedded within our current strategic, strategic plan and um, some of the things that are being required through the plan that was presented tonight. So I think the opportunity to have uh, some information come back from staff would be uh, uh, of great benefit for us. That, that was exactly my thinking on that. So I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to refer the matter to administration for follow-up and report. and. Um, We'll have that at a, a board meeting in the near future. I'm not going to say next board meeting. I'm going to give you a little bit of time. But I, I certainly, at the same time, I want to express how we strongly believe in this. Um, I, I think that when we take a look at what we're doing through our wellness and through our strategic uh, plan, that you know, we make every effort to address this on a daily basis. But I thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, moving on, we have uh, two of our schools who are going to be presenting tonight, and they are presenting as part of the uh, accountability framework, the uh, key result indicators. And what we uh, do for those who are not familiar with the, this process is we're asking schools to come and they're going to be telling us about their schools as it uh, connects to the strategic plan, our crew. And this has always been a wonderful experience, and I hope everyone that comes here is, is, uh, feels it is as wonderful as we do. I know it can be a little bit tense sometimes, but uh, we don't bite. So I'm going to turn this over to uh, Superintendent Bowery. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's my pleasure to first introduce this evening uh, Krista Mano. Uh, some of you have seen Krista. She presented last year when she was principal in Roxmore, and uh, she was moved up the road to North Glengarry County, and uh, this year is principal of Maxwell Public School, and she has some uh, exciting information to share with us about her work in with the team at Maxwell Public. So thank you for coming. And I also want to recognize her cap, uh, Gila Marsh, who's uh, principal of uh, Glengarry District, who's with her here tonight as well. Thank you. Thank you for um, inviting me to the uh, chair tonight to uh, talk about the great things happening at Maxville Public School. So Maxville Public School is a rural community. Uh, it's a K-6 school with 120 students. We have a very active parent uh, group that's very engaged in their children's learning and works very uh, closely with our teachers to ensure that their child is reaching their highest potential. Our grade six students uh, feed into either Tugwa High School or Glengarry District High School, depending on what side of uh, the boundaries they um, live in. And also, um, we've had the full day kindergarten for the last five years. The current state of our school and things that we're very proud about at our school right now is uh, our teachers have very good professional knowledge of curriculum of both the literacy and the numeracy uh, components and have had that over the last number of years. Uh, they continue to read and actively uh, search out any new pedagogy or curriculum uh, changes. They're uh, active in hubs and uh, there, you, there's often conversation around the table uh, about student learning and student work. We have very good EQAO scores, which I'll speak to in a couple of minutes um, as part of my presentation. And as I have said just a couple of minutes ago, one of the things that's a very strong component of our school is that the staff and the parents are very committed to supporting the students to achieve their highest level. So in regards to our communication, one of the things that we are doing very well is communicating with our parent community in the, in the way that what they can do as parents to help their child and work in partnership with our school and our teachers to make sure that every child is getting to a level three or a level four. Uh, one of the things that we use, uh, most schools are using our newsletters, class newsletters, and school newsletters that go home on a monthly basis. 
We also have what's called our fridge fax, and that's a paper copy that some of our teachers send out to parents uh, outlining what's been covered in the classroom during the week, as well as some links to um, different websites, uh, little games that they could play at home to encourage <laughs> literacy or numeracy, such as snakes and ladders and counting up to 100. Um, some activities that parents could still uh, give the encouragement to the kids uh, to continue to build their literacy skills, but stuff that the parent has also have access to. Um, so we provide a paper form. The other thing that we also have, because our, our community has a variety of um, parents, so we have people that need still want a paper copy of items, and we also have the Facebook uh, where we are making student uh, learning very visible. So anything that's happening in the classroom is posted on uh, parent, not parent, but uh, teacher Facebook pages. Uh, it, their learning goals are laid out as well as the criteria of what students would be uh, needing to do in order to achieve the best of their ability. Um, the other part is also that we do have a very strong and active school council and group of volunteers. So we have, um, on average, we have one to eight uh, ratio of volunteers in our school for our student population. In regards to our resources, we continue to work on technology. Uh, one of the parts of technology that we're using mostly right now is capturing uh, the actual learning of students in the classroom and posting it on uh, Facebook pages so parents can see what's happening in the classroom on a daily basis. Uh, we have had a little bit of uh, challenges in regards to uh, some parents not wanting to see uh, their children on the Facebook pages, so we've been trying to do some back shots as well as uh, actual evidence of the work that's being done in the classroom to address that. And as I just mentioned, school council and the parents are very um, involved in experiential learning and support. In regards of our educational programming, I think this is one of the biggest strengths we have at our school. Uh, in our school, our, our staff have worked together for a number of years on setting a continuum throughout the school whereby every st student and teacher in the school knows what the expectations are for every grade level. Um, so we have a writing continuum that's set up and the expectations are laid out uh, with the and it's been developed by the whole school team. And uh, so we have check-ins uh, three times a year just seeing where each kid is on the continuum of learning and then checking in with students that might not have met that level three at a certain time of the school year and what kind of things we're going to do to support them, whether it means touching base with a community partner volunteer or a parent themselves that might be able to help, up with, help us out with the intervention. In the classroom, when you're walking around our classrooms, you will see in every classroom the actual list of what the expectations are for the students, whether it's a writing piece, a reading piece, or whether it's a learning skill. So today's learning skill might be that they're going to be responsible for passing in their agendas and their pencils. And that would be outlined visibly to the students and, and spoken to the students. So if you walk in and ask the student what the expectation of the day is, they will be able to tell you. Uh, we have a 60 minute math block, which is very popular in every school. So that's not really a new thing. Uh, but what we have done this year is we have uh, some combined classes, so a grade two, three class, a three, four class. And what we've been able to do with timetabling is make the uh, math block actual one grade curriculum expectation by the teachers. So all the grade ones go to one class, all the grade twos to one class, all the threes to one class, so that they're actually working on all the expectations of the grade for that 60 minute block. We also have the Empower Reading Program as an intervention for students that are having difficulty with reading uh, and the student would be identified with an exceptionality of a learning disability. In regards to our wellness, uh, that's another area that we're very proud of. We have the leadership training, which I think is an amazing thing that happens at our school, uh, where we train grade four, five, and six students at the beginning of every year 
outlining what it means to be a leader, who leaders are in society, as well as what they can do when they're on the, on the schoolyard, in the hallway, or in the community, if a peer is doing something that they disagree with. So making sure that they have the voice uh, to speak with friends and to try and have that conversation to make sure that they are taking up the leadership uh, roles. We also tie them into our reading, writing, and art buddies, which we have every two weeks. And that allows our older students to meet with the younger students, be leaders, and also provides our staff the opportunity to work on some professional development for an hour. We have sports at our school, homework club, choir, and our grade sixes are involved in what's called an intergenerational program, where they go up to the Maxwell Manor for one hour a week on Wednesdays and meet up with a buddy and talk about life. They might talk about Remembrance Day, uh, Christmas tradition. So it's based a little bit on curriculum and traditions and cultures, as well as sometimes they'll take them down and feed them lunch or help feed in the cafeteria and stuff. So it's a really good combination in the community. Uh, we've tapped in a little bit to using Seven Habits of a Happy Kid, um, and that's a a child's picture book, uh, which we've used to kind of link into our Character Always program as well. And what it, it kind of runs on the seven habits of uh, effective uh, leader or people. So it's, a lot, it's by Sean Covey, but it's giving uh, kids and parents ideas of how to support their child. So if the child's bored, uh, what kind of activities, you know, the child has to take it within themselves that it's not their fault that they're bored, they can find other things to do. And the other thing is we have been the recipient of the Play to Learn uh, grant for from the RBC that was just uh, given to us today, actually, but uh, or released today, I guess. Um, but it's been in the plannings for a couple of months. And our EQAO scores, as I mentioned, we're very proud of our EQAO scores. Um, we've had ongoing uh, very good results over the last number of years. Um, so we've been up in the purple uh, steadily. This past year for the grade threes, we went uh, 94, 194 in our reading, writing, and math, which is all above both uh, board and provincial standards. Um, it wasn't just a one year, it's been a continual practice. So uh, it's the practices that we have in place of working as a team collaboratively, as well as outlining curriculum expectations has continued to sustain within the school. Looking at the grade six data, um, we were in the 80s, set high 70s, 80s, and we've managed to bring it up to the 100 this past year. Um, so again, for our reading, writing, and math scores, they've been uh, regularly above provincial standards and board standards over the last number of years. When we look at the grade three to grade six cohort, 100% um, of our students had achieved the levels um, in grade three at 100% in all the reading, writing, and math, and again at grade six. So it's uh, great news for our school. We're very proud of that. Um, and so we continue to try to sustain that uh, plan of staying on the top. Uh, this is our composite score, so it's a combination over the number of years. So uh, we have had a little bit, you'll see that in 2009, 2011, we were down, but we've moved into uh, more recently into the 90s and more purple. For the math, uh, under the grade six, 2012, 14, we were still you know, going forward. Uh, in a higher level. We did have that um, 79, which is still a good score that we're still proud of, but we did have a little blip in one of our uh, years where we had 61 balance off one year uh, with the 100. So that's why it went down to 79, which we're still quite happy with. Um, so our school success plan uh, at this stage, uh, we have three school success plans. We're moving a little bit into uh, more working in inquiry-based programming with our students, so trying to engage the student voice into our programming, but at the same time staying steady on what the good things we've been doing at the school. The second goal is the problem solving, which we've been doing in math, um, 
and using the communication, collaboration, and inquiry, open-ended questions, um, and being part of the hubs, and just sharing with each other what we can do to make sure that our kids continue to become be good problem solvers when they have the basic skills, but just having them able to use it again in other areas. We do have some, oh, my third goal, sorry, I was gonna do our next steps, but we do have a third goal. Um, one of it's just, again, to continue to uh, work on the leadership skills at our school. Um, one thing that we have heard from our students this year since I've been here, uh, been there, is that um, students definitely want more clubs. Uh, the voice has been very clear um, that they want something different from the homework club, the math club, and uh, the sports club. So we've moved a little bit towards that. Uh, we're actually starting a cooking club uh, next, next week or the week after with a couple of parent volunteers coming in. Um, it's a bit of a challenge because now that we're starting to bring on some clubs, everybody wants into all the clubs. So we're having a little bit of a good engagement of, but of how we're going to balance 120 kids who want to cook, 120 kids that want to make cards. So we've had to uh, come up with a few logistics around that, but we are moving forward. So in regards to our school and what next steps we need to do, um, again, we need to keep our alignment and our EQAO scores staying in, you know, the good, good books, uh, we'll say, in the high 90s. Um, Whenever we have new teachers coming on board, we have to make sure that we mentor those new teachers into the great practices that have already been built by the, stu the staff within the school. And um, so that we can continue the uh, parent communication, the connections with home that help to make our students the best that they are. Uh, uh, responding to the junior voice, as I said, that was one of our things that when we did the junior voice survey, we definitely heard from kids that they definitely want to see more outside activities in the school that were a little bit more variety based. So again, that's building the clubs that we're in the process of doing. So we actually have our grade fours that are doing data analysis in the school right now, uh, figuring out uh, and collecting um, survey tally sheets of what clubs actually they want running in the school. So it's a relevant practice that we've put into place so they have to collect the data and come back and do a presentation to me in regards to what clubs we can start up. Um, and then the last part is uh, we're continuing to try to support, well not try, but we are supporting students that are at risk uh, at our school, like staying with the 5-15%. We do have some kids that are still at risk like every other school, uh, but we do uh, use the family partnership, sometimes grandparents. Uh, so any connection to family that we might be able to find for those students, uh, we tap into, you know, we get everybody on board and uh, just making sure that every student in our building, even if they might be at risk for a short period of time, have a connection to somebody that really cares and loves, loves them because everybody needs to belong and uh, we're all there to support everybody. And uh, so that's uh, Maxwell Public School. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. You're becoming a real veteran. Of this. <laughs> You're getting don't good. send me between us two legs here. <laughs> <laughs> we don't make that don't decision. <laughs> <laughs> yesterday, I, yesterday I was with uh, <laughs> Trustee Wendy McPherson at a meeting, and uh, another commitment has prevented her from being here tonight. But she did say to me, and I know Wendy, you're on the phone line, that she was disappointed she couldn't be here in person to hear this presentation because she's very proud of all of her schools but very proud of what you're accomplishing. So thank you. Comments or questions? Trustee McAllister. I had a whole bunch of questions, but this presentation was so excellent that I don't have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my> this <God. laughs> is being taped. <laughs> Trustee Gardner. No, no, you have to play this a couple of times. So <laughs> exactly. Trustee Gardner. Excellent presentation. Um, um, you, you set a trend for yourself, being your second one, and uh, hopefully we won't be getting you back for another <laughs> few years now. <laughs> we'll keep you at Maxwell, but as, as the chair said, we don't have any say in that. Really. Um, how's your um, enrollment holding out? What, what's been the enrollment for, the, say, the last five years? Has it gone up or down, or? We've been primary, oh, through to you, Chair. 
primarily we've been holding steady. Um, we had one family move away uh, in the fall, which had s six kids in it. So again, um, but we do have a little bit of that, but we have good news that they uh, bought their farm back and are coming back from Switzerland. Uh, so our enrollment's gone up by uh, six or seven kids already for next year. Um, so technically we've been pr holding pretty steady at between 150 and 125 kids over the last five years so we haven't really declined in enrollment it's been pretty much steady so we have for next year's group we have 12 13 grade sixes and we've been kind of bringing in about 12 to 13 14 jk's a year right now so we're kind of maintaining the input output at this stage yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, where is your um peter school for french immersion that's a very good question. We have uh, our main feeder school is Roxmore Public School. And uh, one of the questions that was brought up, oh, through to you, Chair, sorry, um, that had been brought up uh, when I first moved to Maxville was that we had a lot of our students uh, going to French immersion. Uh, we did do a data analysis of that, and we actually only have 10 students from our area that are actually in the French immersion program. Um, so even 10 students isn't going to build the school back up to uh, the 350 that it was when grade sevens and eights were in our area and uh, families were a lot bigger than they are at the moment. So um, so right now, Roxmore would be our French immersion site, but we do not have many students. Choice generally of school is Maxwell right in the uh, town. So. Trustee Wendy McPherson. Yes, hello. Thank you uh, so much for um, uh, doing that presentation. It's my second one and you did a wonderful job. Okay. I'm very proud of Maxwell and how well we're doing in the EQA, of course. Also, um, how uh, how wonderful your parent council is working. They're, they're very impressive. I went to see you on the e-waste um, day. It was bitterly cold and yet uh, the moms and teachers were out there. It was wonderful. Um, I did also want to congratulate you on your donation that you re re received today. Uh, sorry I couldn't be there for your presentation, but I was very proud. Um, and uh, once again, thank you so much. And I don't really have any other questions other than to say carry on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Trustee Bill McPherson. Uh, um, this is presentation is lacking one thread that I've seen in a great many so far. So what is your secret to not having low math results? Like this is very impressive uh, through the chair. So what, I know you can't figure out what the magic elixir is, but if you could bottle it up and distribute it, it might come in handy. I'm not sure if there's a question there, but I think there is. Through to you, Chair. Certainly. Um, I believe it's not just one factor. It, if I could put my thumb on the one factor, then everybody's school would be doing the same thing. Um, as I've said, like there has definitely been a lot of work of collegial planning within the building, as well as continual upgrading of professional development on people's own time to ensure they are keeping up with their current practice and taking the risks at the school to, uh, you know, throw out, uh, I shouldn't say throw out the textbook, but put the textbook aside and uh, do some of the problem solving that might not be, you know, seven sharing different strategies that kids have come up with that might not be the same standard ag algorithm that we would have used going to school because there's many different algorithms that can be used. If you go to different countries, uh, you'll see different things happening. So again, just taking a look at what's being done, sharing strategies among each other so that everybody is feeling successful even you know through the process so and again the parent engagement and parent support is really very uh, strong so if the child is having any difficulty in any area the parents at the school communicating with the teacher coming up with a plan on how to support their child to achieve the best that they can so, director can you add to that thank you uh, 
Krista, I think that um, I'd just like to echo some of the things that uh, Krista has mentioned. Uh, we've recently uh, received the uh, provinces, the Ministry of Education's Math Action Plan, uh, and it very much, uh, some of the strategies very much speak to the kinds of things that uh, Krista spoke of. Uh, knowledgeable staff, a collaborative staff, uh, staff that has confidence in, in teaching mathematics. Um, parent engagement is a significant piece. Um, quality time on task, so it's not that you do uh, 60 minutes of math poorly, you do 60 minutes of math well and you, you are able to achieve results uh, because of that. So uh, this, uh, the math action plan uh, essentially is going to be guiding our work in the area of the improvement of mathematics over the next, next uh, couple of years for sure. Uh, but I dare say it's very, um, um, the, uh, the strategies that are used at uh, Maxville are very much the ones uh, that we need to emulate across our system. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Cram and then Trustee Arnold. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'm also very interested in that math block that you got going. Uh, do you do any cross-grade grouping within that blocking? In other words, uh, the students being taught it academically at the level they're able to do? Through to you, Chair. Um, for this, this is a new thing that we've just done this year because we had more split grades. So generally, this current year, we do not have multi-grades in any class for that math 60 minutes. Um, for other subjects, yes, we do. It's just that 60 minutes of the day where they are in actual only one grade curriculum. Again, from the evidence of data and how our kids are doing, most of our kids are pretty close to grade level working on most curriculum expectations. Um, so it's just the guiding of the problem solving and the collaborative inquiry. Um, we could go to uh, multi-grade and probably have the same results because in the past we've had the same results with math with multi-grade. We just thought we'd try a different strategy this year. And we have smaller groups for the math blocks. Thank That's you. the only reason. Thank you. Trustee Armour? I just did a great presentation. Thank you. Great results. I just have a, a, a question. My research shows that if we engage kids early and we get them involved in, in, in education and, and doing well, that they're successful throughout their, their school career. Do we see Maxville students as they go into high school continue that success? Is there, I, I don't know if we track that. True to you, Chair. Um, we definitely do tracking. We're getting much better as a board of tracking data. Um, and right now, this past, uh, this current year, we've been spending a lot of time of actually drilling down a little bit more with the high schools and our students that feed into the high schools. So we've had meetings with Tugwa and with Glengarry District High School just looking at the kids. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't got to the final results of the streaming part and drilling down to actually whether those people have been successful. But we know from the data analysis that if they're achieving at grade three level, grade six, generally they continue that. Um, but I don't have specific specific data to offer you at this time. But I'm sure it would be possible to find. Bill could find that. Thank you. Any other questions on the phone lines? Thank you so much. It, it's. Um, like I said, it's great to see you again. Thank you. And I want, also want to uh, thank Guy Lamarche, who's the CAP, uh, for that for your area. And Guy, thank you so much for being here and, and support. It means a lot to, uh, I'm sure, to the principals. It means a lot to us as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Our next presentation is uh, Jason Palmer from Rockland Public School. And again, I'll turn this over to Superintendent Valerie. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, we welcome Jason Palmer. Today we're going a little farther north up on the Ottawa River, although that looks like bam. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jason is principal of Brockton Public School, a school in a, a very bilingual community, which he'll probably refer to. And uh, we're pleased to um, have him share his presentation with us today. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, present tonight on Brockton Public School. The first slide I'd like to present is our mission, vision, and values. And the philosophy behind uh, what we do at Rockland Public is that success is everyone's responsibility. We don't just want to be a certain great teacher or an EA or a parent. We want to have the whole school be responsible, including the students, 
for each other's success. The vision is we want to be able to provide students the opportunity to reach his or her full potential, regardless of academic ability, what potential can they reach academically and socially and personally. And our values reflect the character always traits that uh, we support on a daily basis. Our school demographics, this was as October 31st, and we're relatively stable with that right now. I think we're maybe up to about 352 students. We've been growing. When I arrived at Rockland Public in August of 2013, we were projected at 317. And we're now at 352, 353. And registrations are still coming in. So we are growing. Rockland itself is growing as a community, a bedroom community for Ottawa. So we are picking up more students who are coming into the area. We do have a significant percentage of students who have IEPs and have special needs. And that is one of our strengths that I'll be discussing a little bit later. We do have French immersion, and as you'll see with the, the number 267 and 348, so we do maintain French immersion throughout our K-6, to and uh, that is a good sign. With regards to our coterminous board uh, presence, you can see two schools from two different boards by looking at various windows at Rockland Public, and one is just down the road, so uh, we are in competition with uh, coterminous boards. Our EQA results. Look at the grade three reading. We are trending upwards. Uh, we still have a long way to go with that, but we are trending upwards. The grade three writing, uh, we had a strong year in 2011. We tail off a little bit, and uh, but still some work to do. So some decent results, but uh, definitely some work to do. And uh, the math is uh, an area of focus that I'll discuss a little bit later in the presentation. Grade six reading, um, there was a little blip in 2012. Uh, we're, we're trending upwards, as well as with uh, the writing, again, a little blip last year. But uh, we're still not quite at the provincial standard, though, so there's some work to do there, and I'll discuss that in a bit. Our school data. So students have met the standard in grade 3 and grade 6. Uh, reading and writing. Uh, writing in particular isn't uh, that bad with some work to do, of course. And we're going to focus on math. The, the key percentage that stands out for me is the students did not meet the standard in three or six at 40% for math. And we certainly need to work on that. I wanted to include a slide on our results with students with special needs. So as I mentioned, we have a significant portion of our students who have IEPs. So the grade three reading and writing, uh, we are head of the province, uh, near, near the province in reading and writing, but our grade sixes outperform the province. So the work we do with our special needs students, who may not be at level three, but certainly outperform the results, um, I think are quite strong. One thing that we wanted to do this year was add more variety to, to the data that we look at when we make decisions at the school. Didn't want it to be just EQO or perceptual or opinions based. We wanted to include more, more voice. So we, we ran a junior survey. Uh, to get some ideas from students how they perceive the school. So we can compare that with what maybe the staff is thinking at the school. The school culture scan we run twice a year. And we have done two parent surveys. We were involved with the pilot parent survey last fall and we ran another one again in the spring. Again, to sort of see what parents are saying about our school. Unfortunately, the percentage of respondents was quite low, about 12 or 13%. So we need to work on getting that out uh, to the parents and hopefully getting more of a response from them. My apologies for the very small uh, text. Our communication goal as a school was we really wanted to strengthen communication between the school and, and the parents. And that's to engage the parents, that's also to um, engage the students and keep them involved. Part of the reason for the communication goal was that parents were saying that they weren't always informed of things in a timely manner. So things get busy, teachers doing a variety of things. So that's why we were going to come up with the Team Snap application. So we can send information out in a timely manner to staff. Resources. We've identified resources that we feel we need at the school in terms of uh, IT technology and print. We've prioritized those resources and uh, we also involve the students so we can have a targeted plan to increase the level of resources in the school to support student learning. 
educational programs. We wanted to focus on critical thinking because we wanted students to practice being uh, active learners instead of passive learners. We want them to think critically when they're looking at text or they're looking at a science experiment or whatever it is that they're learning in the class. We also wanted to engage the parents <coughs> and uh, organize a math night because in talking to parents, some of them have um, a, a lack of comfort in terms of helping their children with math because it's much different than when, when they were in school. So we want to engage them and, and give them some skills to help their children with math. Our wellness? Our wellness uh, focus is based on both the staff and the students. <coughs> so we want the staff to know that there are supports in place for them. There are different ways of, of getting things done with the use of technology, communication with parents, and also that their wellness will reflect in their teaching and their level of ability at work. For the students, we want a variety of intramural and extracurricular activities, of course with the QDPE. Again, we wanted their junior survey. We have strong, or strong connection with CHEO, uh, and in fact, we are recommended by CHEO to families who have students with special needs who are in the Rockland area. And of course, we have our, our regular student success team meetings, and we have a child youth worker on site for two or three days a week. Special programs at Rockland Public School. Last year, we introduced the WITS program, which is an anti-bullying program. It stands for Walk Away, Ignore, Talk It Out, or Seek Help. Now it was introduced to the staff last spring, and we rolled it out to the students uh, in September. And it, it's caught on very, very well um, amongst the student population. You can hear them saying, I would like to use my wits, or I use my wits, when they've uh, become involved in a conflict or situation in the school or on the yard. And we've had two uh, anti-bullying public service announcements with some of our grade four students who went to the Jewel 92.5 in Clarence Rockland. And with a member of the Ottawa Red Blacks, they made a couple of public service announcements. And I think, if possible, we can play one of them for you. Hi, I'm Amber from Rockland Public School. And I'm James Green, linebacker for the Ottawa Red Blacks. James, did you know that you should always have a good game plan to deal with bullies? Game plan? Just like in football? Well, sort of. But I'm talking about using your wit. Wits? What's that? Wits teaches kids like me strategies to use to deal with teasing and bullying. So, Amber, how do you use your wits? It's easy, James. When someone starts bothering you, walk away, ignore, talk it out, or seek help. I get it. Wits is like a game plan. Exactly. Now can we do our cheer? All right. Bring it in, team. On three. One, two, three. Use your wits! This message was brought to you by the kids at Welcome Public School and the Ottawa Web Blacks. <laughs> so uh, if you're in the 92.5, you'll uh, they'll be playing until the end of the school year uh, on a regular basis. There's another one too, but I, I didn't uh, bring that one with me. So it's really caught on in the school, and I think it's helped with uh, peer relationships in the school. It ties in very well to character always because the resources with the WITS program are tied actually to the curriculum. So teachers can go on the site, they can pull resources out, we have books, we read books during our character assemblies to reinforce the message of both the WITS program and the character always. And we have a work skills program for students who are on the spectrum or simply need uh, roles in the school to make them feel part of the school. So they'll do little jobs uh, in the mornings, they'll get together, they've, they've got uh, meetings with each other and they've become uh, sort of leaders within the school. So it's a really good program uh, for them. Extracurricular activities. We've really expanded the number of extracurricular activities that we've offered the students, and that was part of the junior survey comments, that they wanted more uh, than what we were offering. It was okay if you were into athletics, but really wasn't much else. So we started in our club. There's a meet a week club, which is a group that gets together and discusses a variety of, of topics, both local and international. We have uh, there's an art club, and we're also allowing the students to start forming their own clubs which has some challenges because it changes two or three days. They want to try a different club. But the most recent one is a newspaper club. But the students are they're writing their own newspaper, they're showing it to me, and then we're sending it to the grade sixes. So it just gives them more opportunities to get involved. And we do a ver variety of uh, public events, like the food drive and the Christmas elves, where we raise money and give it to the local Valorous chapter so they can buy Christmas presents for 
families that can't afford it. What's working well at our KPS? As I mentioned before, the strong results for students with special needs. Our work with students on the spectrum and high needs is recognized. Our school council really has um, come on its own the last couple of years. They've really gotten involved in the school, school greening projects to make the school more aesthetically pleasing, but they're also engaged in, in, in wanting to know what's going on in the classrooms. It's not just the outside of the school, they're focused on what's going on the inside. We do have after school daycare, uh, connections with Valorous. Emergent Minds is a, is a company that will come in and work with students around the spectrum. I strongly believe that there's a foundation for change at Rockland Public amongst the staff. They do want to go in a different direction. There's always some trepidation when a change is involved and we're working through that, but I get the sense talking to staff that they are ready. We want to increase student engagement and student achievement. Those are obvious two things, but the student engagement part is the, the first thing, it's the foundational part that we'll be working on. And increase it in data use. So we've established a data team that will drill down, work with teachers to not just look at a percentage of EQAO, for example, but why is that percentage the way it is? What parts of the strands and the curriculum need to be focused on in order to help students achieve better and improve? We've established a, a literacy team to do the same thing for those two main components. And they have met and we're starting to do that. It does take time because uh, you need to accurately and effectively and properly analyze and interpret the data or else you go off in a different direction. So we are working on that. And we're considering various types of data, uh, proximal, distal, latitudinal, perceptual, in addition to EQAO. Our next steps. I've asked the staff to look at math in a K-6 to focus, not just grade 3 and grade 6. What skills are taught in kindergarten and grade 1? How are those skills cumulative throughout the, the K-6 to years? And what's the effect uh, of a skill that isn't mastered in grade 1 when they get to grade 5 and grade 6? When I was involved in the math hubs, I noticed that things that were taught and learned in grade 3 did have a major effect when they got to grade six, if they didn't master those skills. And that's what I want the staff to, to focus on. I'd like staff to move, and we've talked about this with staff, in terms of co-creating exemplars. So we've gone through the uh, growing success document, what's identified in there, and how to move that uh, forward in, in their classrooms. Technology increase and in use, which we talked about. Uh, I've asked the staff to be aware of what's called the, the digital divide, and that is we do have students who, when they leave school, do not have access to technology or the internet. So if we're assigning internet-based homework or assignments, we need to be careful because if they can't access that at home, they come back to school the next day and they're further behind. So we need to be uh, aware of that and cognizant of that. The triangulation of data, so I've talked to staff, again, this is growing success about observations, conversations, and product. So it's not just the, the written product that's being assessed, it's a triangulation of all that data and working with staff to create a theory of action and how we're going to move our goals more tied, tied directly to student achievement, the school improvement plan uh, for student achievement. So the, those four areas that are listed, uh, literacy, numeracy, <coughs> assessment evaluation, and bridging the gap, uh, closing the gap in wellness. So those are the next steps that we have. And um, I do believe we have a culture of collaboration that uh, Rockland needs to be enhanced and furthered, but I do believe that uh, the foundation is there. That's my presentation. Thank you very much. Before we go to comments and questions, those, those of you on the telephone lines, there's, there's a little bit of background noise, so you can either control the noise there a little bit or, or mute, if you don't mind. Thank you. Okay, comments or questions? Trustee Cartman. Uh, thank you, Jason. Jason is in my area, and I've been in the school several times, and I'm very impressed. Uh, with how um, the parents feel quite comfortable about coming to the school and being part of the parent council. He, he is right in saying it has grown over the past few years and uh, they are a, cre a keen group of people both interested in their students, their children's learning, and making themselves visible in the community. And one example of that is every uh, the last two uh, Santa Claus parades in, in Rockland, a parent council has put together um, a float with the children on it and uh, the first year they did that, I was present with Jason and, and we had to keep each other real warm 
because it was one of the coldest days in December, I think, or November. And unfortunately, I didn't make it this year. Um, if you remember trustees, we uh, our Trustee Innovation Award was received by one of the staff members at uh, Rockland Public last year, Diane Mount, who has worked closely with the Parent Council on the Greening Project, and they have great plans for uh, making the school uh, both a great learning place in the outdoor education uh, piece and the beginning of the school or the entrance of the school. So um, uh, just to refresh your memories that Rockland Public School was in, uh, in the news. We do have a lot of competition in Rockland and uh, um, I think it's important that you continue to work with the staff and, and with the community and, and uh, get the message out there that uh, Rockland Public School is present. You're growing. The school is growing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just wonder if there's anything else that uh, you think could be done um, to increase the visibility of the school uh, in Rockland. Because we have close neighbors both on both sides that the yeah, the board is present. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Through the chair. I, I believe it's, again, it's, it's parent council is getting out in the community and they're going into the businesses and they're, they're having them come in. Uh, in terms of donating, for example, to the, to the float and uh, just getting our name and our brand out there. Uh, I think branding is, is a, one of the key areas that we have to work on in Rockland. So wherever we send something out or we put an announcement in the paper or even when we put signage up for full day kindergarten registration, I think we have to get our brand out there because uh, people driving down the street, uh, just the street where Rockland Public is, they could hit two other signs from two other schools and the branding is there. So I do believe that's a key thing to to, uh, to do not just around our school, but in the entire Rockland city itself. Because we're, we're sort of tucked in a part of Rockland that's oh, off on its own, so to speak. We're not in the, in the heart of the city. Other comments? You just have to get out in Highway 17 with placards and say, mm -hmm. we're over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Yeah. Thinking about the float. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Can you talk to us a little bit more about team, the Team Snap app? Sure, for the chair. This is a, an app that um, you can have multiple accounts, but you can have one manager. And what we're getting staff to do is to go on this and they can put all of the key dates they have coming up. So it shows up on one calendar. So when we start sending newsletters home, I can print out that one calendar and send it home for the following month. So rather than this teacher sending a newsletter with with a key date on it and somebody else saying a newsletter home or I send home one newsletter with a variety of dates on it, we can send home a calendar saying here's the intramurals that are going on for the month, here's the field trip for the month, here are key things that uh, you, you might want to know about. So it's not getting piecemeal. Uh, we can put dates on Facebook, but I think it's better to send one sort of calendar home each month with everything that's going on in the school. And what was happening was there was great things going on, but I would find out maybe a day before it was supposed to happen because there was maybe a clash Thing or class activity and uh, we want to get that out to the parents well in advance so that they know what's going on. Sometimes parents want to come in and the newsletters don't always get home so I can always post the calendar on, uh, on the website and on Facebook as well because parents will say well my child didn't bring the newsletter home or my child didn't tell me about this until last night and I can't get in. So we, we want the parents to be more engaged in the school and we're hoping to do that electronically through TeamSnap but we can also send it home for those who don't have access to, to electronics. Mr. McAllister. Other than uh, communication of dates, etc., yes. uh, is there a possibility of using this app as a, a way of engaging parents in the learning of their children? I think it's, it's a calendar app. Uh, I'll have to talk to the staff member who mentioned it, who take, said she would take the lead on it. Um, are you referring to a sort of uh, things that they could do with their children to help them improve? Is that mm -hmm. what you're... Yes. Yeah, I'd have to look into if that's a, an element that we could include in that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Comments online? Mr. Chair, David. Go ahead, Trustee McDonald. Thank you. Um, Mr. Palmer, it's a good presentation. I enjoyed listening to it. I, I wanted just to focus in on um, the educational program portion that you talked about on the, um, the math nights. Um, have you had an opportunity to, uh, to conduct one of those yet, or what is the uh, the plan to move forward with those? Thank you, Through the chair. We were thinking, working with parent council, we were thinking more of a spring, 
because um, we don't want weather to be a factor uh, in planning this. So we're going to involve the parent council in the math night, and we're also we've had two teachers who are involved in, in the math hubs who volunteered to run a little mini lesson and sort of explain to the parents what it is that we're trying to do with the students to help them learn math uh, and maybe get through some of the reluctance of how to help their children with math. And then the second part of that would be a board games night, uh, whether we do it the same nights or whether it would be a separate night, we haven't decided yet. And that would be just to show the parents that math can be fun and learning can be fun. And if you're sitting at home with your child at night or on the weekend or in the summer, you could play a math game, a math board game and they're learning and they're having fun and you're engaged with, with your children. So that's the general outline, but it hasn't uh, occurred yet. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair, if I may continue. Go ahead. I think, I think it's important that you, um, I, I look forward to, to hearing more about this. I think you captured in your statement or in your comments, uh, many parents um, would say that this is not their way of learning math in the past. And, and I think the frustrations um, of children in our schools it becomes heightened when they go home and uh, little Susie and little Johnny are trying to do their math homework and, and mom and dad just can't comprehend what they're actually trying to do. And that's no, no disrespect to the parents, it's just a, it's a different way of, of, uh, of doing things. So the frustration of children not being able to do uh, something and then um, having a situation at home uh, might just uh, to lead to more anxiety. So. I think it's important that we engage parents and uh, try and help them through that process. And, uh, and I look forward to hearing more about that. The second point I have is, um, and I think you said it was SNAP or I can't recall what the uh, exact name was, I, wanting to communicate with parents and uh, making sure the information get home, gets home in a, in a timely fashion is important. And the board, we've invested a considerable amount of time and energy and some, some dollars as well into my family room. Um, and also Office 365. And Office 365 has the capability of, of uh, sending calendar um, uh, meeting appointments, those types of things into students' calendars, uh, which parents could access. And My Family Room allows you to push information out to parents in many forms that they're looking for. Um, have you been engaged in the My Family Room process? And uh, are, we, are we looking to explore all the tools that we have within the board before we look at something external? To the chair, um, yes, this uh, this goal was set uh, last fall before my family room was really up and running. But we, I have been engaged in the process. We have had families who have registered, uh, who've received letters, and uh, who have also asked me some questions about security with regards to my family room. So I've been answering some questions. But I, I agree with you. Any any way to get the message out to parents and engage them in, in, in terms of communication. Uh, whether this would be external, this may actually be replaced by my family room or Office 365. That's something I would have to talk get over with uh, parent council, as well as my school improvement uh, team. But uh, we don't want to duplicate. But at the same time, we want to make sure the message gets out. But uh, I think that's a great point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I can just follow up. Yes, I agree. We don't want to duplicate. But if we develop a process um, that we, as a board, have been. Um, endorsed and want to ensure that that is the uh, the tool for which we can get information out um, we need to make sure that we put all of our efforts in, into exploring it and uh, and pursuing that opportunity for parents to get into the uh, the process of signing up if we don't do that uh, we're missing an opportunity and um, it's pretty hard to evaluate the use of a system if uh, if no one's using it thank you any other comments questions well, Jason, thank you so much. Krista Gay, thank you so much for the long trip. I know that all three of you have a long drive home. Be safe, and thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to the next item, which is the school budget planning. Um, just a little background. In uh, February 2014, a crew charter R34 was commissioned, and that came out of a discussion at the board table. Uh, that uh, initially began with uh, some of our schools having surplus money and uh, from that came a discussion on uh, budgeting at that at school level. So in uh, May of two th or May 28, 2014, a team under uh, Tracy Mayer, uh, who is our manager of, sub of uh, school support and internal audit, presented its findings along with 29, 29 proposed actions uh, to this um, 
from that meeting, there was a request that the Committee of the Whole receive a status report on the implementation of the action plan. Within the report, uh, our 34 school budget planning report, uh, May 2014, at the January 2015 meeting. That is now. So uh, we are very keen and very interested to see Tracy, and I, I'm going to take this through um, Superintendent Barclay. You're going to introduce, I'm sure. And uh, I'm really pleased to see where we are now in terms of this whole process. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't have much to, to add to what, what you introduced, except to introduce Tracy. And uh, uh, Tracy willingly uh, well, had been involved in the original project and then uh, willingly took on the role of leading, uh, working with uh, various stakeholders uh, to assess each of the proposed actions, uh, make decisions as to uh, what would uh, make the best sense to implement. Um, it's true that the project really was triggered by the spike in school budget surpluses at the end of 12-13. But uh, when the crew charter was created, it really uh, emphasized or focused as well on making that connection with between the school budget and the school success plan. So it is, it is multifaceted and, and not strictly just based on the balances. So uh, Tracy, uh, with others, has made uh, good progress, and she's going to tell you about that. And uh, uh, we completed one in, uh, in June, uh, rather than wait till the next June coming up, and we did get the projected uh, budget allocations out to principals. Uh, I must admit it was getting very near the end of June, and we want to uh, get them out sooner this year but uh, still they were in the hands of principals much sooner, uh, months sooner than they were the year before. So I will uh, pass it over to Tracy to let her uh, fill you in on, on the activity to date. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I'm happy to be here tonight to provide the board with an update on the school budget planning project. A lot of work has been completed. There is a lot more to do, but I think you'll see that there's been a quite a bit of uh, progress in the project. So just a little bit of background to get started. So the project was started to identify the reasons excess funds remained in school budgets at the end of the 12-13 uh, uh, fiscal year, and also to ensure that schools are developing budgets that specifically support their school success plans, and then to propose any actions or improvements in school budgets and the budget process. So the approach to the project uh, we started in March last year, and the team was put together, and that was myself, Don Lewis, the principal of Seaway, Lori McElhern, the principal of Nation View, and also Vicki Adrain, who is, all, is one of our financial assistants for the Perth uh, families of schools. So as a team, we developed 10 questions, and we selected 20 schools to go to, along with uh, T.R. Leger also. And we also interviewed uh, five central budget owners and the manager of budget and uh, forecasting. So some of the desired outcomes of the project are to further align the school success plans and the budgets that support them, to implement a threshold for the level of school surpluses that should be in budgets at year end, to have better links between central office fund transfers and the school success plans, and also to have uh, ongoing training and communication of best practices around budget. So for the update, we had 29 proposed actions. We have completed 13, <coughs> 13 are in progress, and we have three that are not yet started, and those are mostly not started basically because of timing, because they relate to um, forecasting for the end of the year. So they will be started soon, though. <coughs> so what has been completed so far? Uh, so communication uh, to financial assistance at the schools to make sure that they get all the communications about any central funding that's going out into school budgets. Um, also, the next two, they were kind of critical because the report was brought to the board in uh, May 2014, 
and right after that um, in June is when the schools actually start their school success planning. So it was pretty critical to start making changes straight away. So right away in June last year, we had a section added on to the school success plan template, basically just very simple, uh, but just something that they could put budget in there and to get the schools thinking about budget and their school success plans. The other part uh, that happened straight away was that there was um, an estimated budget allocation given out to the schools in June. And in the past, typically what happens with school budgets is that after the enrollment is um, comes in in September, then in October the schools are provided with their budgets for the year. So last year they actually received an estimate in June and that was so that they could have that estimate at the same time as when they were doing their school success planning. So what we were trying to do is align those two processes. As well, last year the occasional list was reviewed by Human Resources and the number of available staff for schools was addressed. So those were items that were completed right away. So also some items that have been completed. Uh, at the end of August, uh, we always have on an annual basis uh, because our fiscal year end is August 31st. So we have a training session with our financial assistance. And as we had been talking about surpluses in school budgets, we talked to them and wanted them to focus on making sure that all their expenses were in for the year. And so we suggested that if they wanted to, they could also process uh, an accrual. And what that means basically is that, uh, for example, if a school had uh, a busing, uh, a field trip in June and they had busing costs, but they had not paid that invoice by the end of August because they hadn't received it, then they could put an entry in so that it would show up in their, it would come out of that year's budget. That's what the accrual part would be. Uh, then in October, there were actually a couple of training sessions held and they were held with financial assistance and principals as well. And they focused a lot on best practices and these were best practices that came up in our interviews with principals around budget. So we started off, we were talking about uh, the process for schools when they allocate funds to their departments. And so a lot of this typically, uh, it does happen in elementary but uh, even more so in secondary where secondary school will have a math department, phys ed department, history department, and they might just allocate, say, $1,000 to each department for their budget. So what we had suggested to principals and financial assistants is that instead of doing this traditional allocation of funds, have your departments pull the funds from the budget. So have them actually apply for money from the budget. And at the same time, we talked about to best practice where, of course, when then when you've got departments applying for funds for budget, there's never enough money to go around. So then you have to prioritize. So one of the best practice we found was that the actual leaders of the departments would get together and they would know what each department has applied for out of the budget and prior prioritize which department should get funding based on what the school success plan included. We also did at that time provide a sample application form for allocation of funds that schools could use. One of our secondary schools had a really good example and so we provided that to all of the schools. The other part of that was when um, quite often principals have staff basically approach them saying, can I have money for this, that, for a field trip, or might be for resources. And so basically to try and keep everything uh, linked in with the school success plan was just giving them some sort of key questions that they could ask staff when they're, they're asking for funds. So asking questions like, how does this support the school success plan? How does it support uh, student learning? Those would be items that would help them focus uh, making sure that the, uh, the funds would be related to the school success plan. So the next couple of items uh, relate to account codes. Um, so basically, 
the suggestion to schools was to use their gen general ledger account codes um, to budget their school success funds. So to try and be as detailed as they can be when they're doing their budget and not sort of put everything on one line, but try to separate out what they're um, using for their school success plan. And the other suggestion to schools as well was that uh, as funds, if a school has a surplus at the end of the year, it's uh, rolled over in a lump sum uh, to make sure that the, that surplus is allocated the way it should be. So if they had funds left over from a specific initiative, to make sure that it was budgeted the same way the following year. And then the other thing we suggested as well was that whenever they are reviewing their school success plan, at the same time to have their financial assistant provide them with a budget update, maybe an overall update, but also an update on what they had budgeted for their school success plan and what they've already spent. <coughs> so in progress, still a lot of items. Um, human resources training for uh, principals and vice principals. Um, there will be some training in the spring on um, absentee support. So that's going to be happening, happening in a couple of months. Um, we are also in finance reviewing the uh, school expense processing. What we found in talking to schools, what they, they were saying that there was quite a time lag when things were actually going through their budgets and that makes it a, a little bit difficult for them to do some tracking. So we're trying to work in the finance department to see if there's some things, uh, some procedures that we can maybe uh, improve so that we can um, do those a little quicker. The other item is to uh, finance as well to review the occasional teacher costs for the school budget allocation. Every year schools are allocated so much money for uh, occasional teacher costs and uh, there is a, a certain uh, formula that's used based on averages and we need to make sure that that's uh, updated. We are also working on, and actually today I did receive uh, a report and it's, um, it's a school budget report but it's actually been improved and there's been some columns added so that schools can use the report for doing forecasting as well. And I believe that that's going to be run for the first time uh, this weekend. So schools will see that next week. So what they'll see is their regular school budget report where they have their, their budget and their expenses and what's left over. And then there will be columns on the other side where they can put in an actual forecast to the end of the year or the end of the month, whatever they're working on. And then it would show them what's uh, basically what their situation is going to be at that, that time. We are also working on a, a procedure for tracking occasional teacher costs against the school budget. There is again a bit of a time lag there with um, when timesheets are submitted and depending on when the pay date is, there could be up to a month lag between when a timesheet is uh, submitted and when it actually goes through a school budget. And that again uh, makes it a little bit difficult for the school to see where they actually are. So we have actually a draft of a procedure that financial assistants can use um, to track those costs against their school budget. Also part of the project was looking at the uh, principal exit planning checklist template. And there was, uh, there is a financial section in it, but it was a little bit outdated and it didn't talk about the financial assistant. So we had it updated and basically that's just to make sure that there's a an overlap between uh, an outgoing and an incoming principal to make sure that if they've got funds allocated for something in specific or if there's something to do with even school generated funds that the incoming principal will be uh, up to date on everything. Then the other part uh, and this is probably the most uh, time consuming part is the uh, information gathering with the central departments. So what we've done is we have uh, put together a template and all the central departments <coughs> have uh, sent it back with information on what, uh, who's responsible, what budgets they take care of, 
um, how they determine how funds are allocated to the schools and how funds are transferred as well. Uh, sometimes funds are transferred um, through the budget, through journal entry, or um, schools are given a central code to use. So we're looking at that template and we're trying to um, do some standardizing of processes as well as um, giving basically information to the schools on central funding. It's a little bit uh, confusing. I find it confusing knowing which department is, is responsible for which budgets. So we're hoping that that will help the schools um, just that information. And then with all of these items, there's always uh, ongoing training. So we did the sessions in October. Uh, in December, there was actually a, a session as well for uh, new principals, uh, basic finance training. So those are all the items that are in progress. So the next steps with the project are to finish off the items that we just looked at, so everything that's in uh, progress. And then the last items that we need to get uh, started on are uh, having uh, the finance department develop recommendations for school budget sur surpluses. Um, so talking about thresholds, if a school should be, if they're wanting a specific item, should they save through their budget? Should they borrow money from the board um, and document that? We do have a policy around budget surpluses, um, so it may uh, result in, in an update. Then the other part would be, uh, and we're working on that right now, is training the financial assistance on completing uh, school budget forecasts. Uh, that's the part that the, uh, the school budget report, the forecasting part, that will help them with that. So there will be training. And also having the uh, financial assistance and principals making sure that departments that do have uh, budgets, that they are spending that money and that they have, um, that they spend the money before the end of the year. And if they don't need to, that then it could be allocated to a different department department or for a different use. So in conclusion, um, basically we're looking at all the proposed actions to be done by the end of the school year. I think timing is key with a lot of these items. Um, and completing the 29 proposed actions will re result in school administration being better equipped to manage their budgets and uh, having their budgets in support of their school success plans. Thank you. Thank you. Comments or questions? Trustee Bill McPherson. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, will this kind of, now that you've got kind of a standard method of handling school budgets, kind of ease the speed bump that we used to get the odd time when we had a principal change and you would get essentially two different cultures of handling a school budget. Uh, well, let's bring some consistency to that shift. Through you, Chair. Um, one of the things we did find in speaking to principals is that there are a lot of different philosophies out there about money. Um, some principals like to save, some like to spend, and um, I think that one of the items that we were looking at with the thresholds and uh, saving versus um, having a school loan, I think that that would uh, address that because it would more or less make the decision for uh, you know what would be the most you should have as a surplus in your budget, and if you do, then um, if you do need to have a surplus, then documenting that. So I think that should take some of the, uh, the variableness okay. out of that. Dr. Patterson? If I can just follow up with what Tracy has offered. I think the other piece, uh, Trustee McPherson, is that um, with the um, focus on uh, the improvement of teaching and learning across our district, uh, while there are local uh, variations and nuances in schools, I think you will find over the coming years that uh, there's quite a bit of cons consistency with regard to uh, how schools spend their money. In, order, in other words, they spend their money uh, to support uh, student learning and student well-being. So 
Uh, I think there might be a little bit more of a um, more um, streamlined approach to the expenditure of finances, and certainly the strategy of uh, of the transition from one principle to another, so that there is good dialogue before the um, uh, current principal leaves the school in, you know, in, in anticipation of a replacement. I think that will also support it, so it won't be so so much of a uh, uh, you know a roller coaster, if you will, uh, and stabilize considerably. Thank you, Trustee Cram. Do I read it properly that schools can carry over money from one school year to another? Uh, through your chair, yes, that's right. Where is that money stored or kept? <laughs> I'll maybe n let Nancy answer that for you. <laughs> Through you, Chair. The money, uh, the money in effect in cash exists, um, but this is uh, the, the challenge with with having that policy is when the total surpluses remain fairly consistent from year to year. We can plan for those each year. Uh, what generated this project in the first place was because we had a spike in one year uh, in those surpluses that were remaining. In effect, um, it's not really that we just carry it forward. Uh, what we have to do is budget for those expenses in the year in which the, it will be spent. So it can create a challenge in the next year if, if the amount that we need to take out of those revenues is greater than we had anticipated the year before. Therefore, um, the, the thought is that if we put some kind of a threshold and get uh, some parameters around that, uh, that will help to some degree. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. The, um, I have a question for either or both Tracy and the, the director. But the perception uh, is that in the public, and I dare say perhaps even among some of our staff in schools, is that there are not enough resources, be they human or financial. But in effect, this is not really the case. I noticed that the, the purpose of the project is to ensure that all the schools are developing budgets that specifically support school success plans and that one of the desired outcomes is that there's a further alignment between school success plans and the budgets that support them. Um, how deeply are the staff involved in the development of budgets? Because if they're developed, if, they're, if we want an alignment between the school success plan and the budget, then the school success plan, which is formulated collaboratively with the staff implies that the budget too must be collaboratively reached. Is that happening or? Um, Trustee McAllister, I, Tracy, perhaps you can, you follow up. I'll start and you, you follow up and it might be helpful also to get a, a superintendent of schools uh, to speak to this as well, uh, just because they have more uh, daily contact with the principals and their budgets. But um, I would have to say that um, certainly in many of our schools, um, the school success plan, yes, I, I think in all of our schools, the school success plan uh, is developed collaboratively with the staff. Um, the uh, um, the um, connection to the budget, I think, is a new is a newer concept. We've been developing our school success plan longer than we have uh, actually attaching uh, budgetary numbers to the school success plan. So I think that's that's more of a newer phenomenon, um, and I think it happens in some schools and and perhaps doesn't in others. I can tell you that in the elementary school, in the elementary schools, the elementary staffing. <coughs> Um, in addition to reviewing staffing, uh, also um, has an opportunity to review budgets. So that's a sort of, um, a, there's a structure in place that, that assists that in happening. So whether those budgets are de developed collaboratively uh, in their entirety, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but certainly uh, there are many schools where uh, the, the school success plan is, is uh, developed, uh, the budget is set, and the budget is shared um, with uh, the staff. Um, so that's 
that's what I know. Um, in well, I certainly know it in our elementary schools. I can't. I don't know specifically what happens in the secondary schools. Um, I just wanted to comment that it varies a bit, but I, I know that we do have a lot of schools that involve their staff. Um, in some schools, they actually ha they have a school success team and they even have a budget team. Now, I don't know how many schools we have like that, but there are some out there. And they do, uh, several schools do review their school expenditure report at their staff meetings so that they keep their staff up to date. I think that uh, they are trying more and more to involve their staff so that they'll take up ownership of it as well. And especially in secondary, uh, like the PAR leaders will be involved. When I was talking about the department uh, spending, that type of thing, they're very much involved in at least that part of it. Thank you. Yeah, I just, one may I is this a, yeah, just to this, follow up to this. Yes, Sorry, go I ahead. think a, a, a very significant change since I was in schools is that it used to be um, we allocated a certain dollar figure to divisions or departments. And it was really based on what we did last year. Uh, so we gave the such and such department so much money. Now it's very much more, okay, these are our needs. And so this is where we're going to devote our resources. And, and I think that is a, certainly a change in the right direction. Uh, and it, it would be a very common practice now rather than just, you know, because we did it last year, we're going to do the same thing this year. So. Is this a follow-up to this? No, it's a secondary. Okay. okay, come back to you. Sure. Okay, Trustee Carton and then Trustee McPherson, and then I'll come back to you. Thank you, Mr. Foreman. Trustee McPherson. Um, like, I've got two issues, so I'll just throw one out right now through the chair. How involved are the school councils in setting the school budgets? Because quite often there's a lot of fundraising going on in the schools. So does that money remain separate, or does that get rolled into the school budget for extracurricular things that cannot be covered under the school budget, like, say, uh, bus trip to Upper Canada Village. Oh, through, through you, Chair. So every school has its own bank account, which would be their school generated funds account. So any fundraising or lunch programs, anything like that that's done at the school is, is kept in the bank account. So that's kept totally separate from the their school budget. Okay, so therefore, by intimation, the school council is not involved in setting these right. monies, okay. Do you have a second question to that? Um, can a principal, if he's anticipating a special event, uh, for instance, next year is the 200th anniversary of the settling of Lanark County. Uh, I know there's a great many celebrations happening. Uh, mm -hmm. We have the prong match coming to Dundas County. Can a principal say a couple of years in advance say, we're going to participate in this event and I need to bank so many dollars. Can, is that process going to be built into this? Through the chair. Through you, Chair? Mm -hmm. Yes, they can do that. That's one of the things that we've, we've talked about. Um, schools do also have the opportunity if they want to get a, a loan from the board as well, up to a certain percentage of their budget. So that's one of the uh, I guess the guidance that we need to give schools is, is, is it more appropriate to save through your budget or to get a school loan? And that's one of the actually proposed actions of the project. But yes, they can uh, save up. Could you want to add to that? May, may I Certainly. Add Certainly. Um, the, other, the other thing is uh, if the school principal decides to save for a particular initiative event, and it isn't a capital item or equipment or something for which they would get a loan, um, we are going to, it's one of the ones in progress, request of the principal if they have a, a certain level of surplus for a, a plan so that we're aware of why they have that surplus and they have a reason for having it and what they're planning for. Uh, we have not done that in the past. We've asked for plans to get out of a deficit 
but we haven't done it for surpluses, so we will be doing that. Trustee Gardner, thank you. Um, this might not be um, the right question to ask right now, but you can tell me yes or no, or so can the chair can rule the other order. <laughs> um, we're finding that uh, some, of the, <laughs> some of the language that is being used in our, our schools and in our, our councils is, is rather on the negative side, side as uh, Trustee McAllister referred to, that there's not enough money in the budget to do this. There's not enough money to do that. Is there anything that your um, committee is looking at in how to inform the parents about the budget process in schools? Um, we know that we're, we're extending it to staff members now and they're having more say into how the budget is set in the schools. But are we extending that information out to the parents so they understand the budgeting process in a Budget 101 for dummies. I don't know what you want to call it, but uh, some kind of message is going out to the parents to show just how much money we have to work with, and this is where we have put it. Uh, through yeah. you, Chair. Yeah. Not that I I know of. We certainly, as a board, haven't really been doing anything like that. Now I don't know if there are principals, um, you know, on their own that share that information with their councils. I I suspect that there probably are. But it's not typically something that we've gotten involved with. Director, can you add some more? <clears throat> I would say that it's a very common practice for uh, principals to share their budget with uh, the school council. Uh, not, I, I don't know about you know how much input the school council has provided into the operational budget of the school. Um, but um, certainly, I think it's a fairly common practice uh, that the budget is shared. Now, your, your additional sort of question is the language that is used. Um, and uh, with respect to this is where we've devoted our resources because this is what we feel is important versus, um, well, we didn't give, they didn't give us enough money, so, you know, this is the problem. So, you know, perhaps there can be some uh, support uh, for s principals and school staff, et cetera, to, um, um, to align the messages, to, uh, to align the messages with, the, uh, with what they've identified in their um, school improvement plans. Yeah. I think that's a positive move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. McAllister. Are you here? Yes, go ahead. We'll go to the phone line and come back. Yes, go ahead. Um, I have a question in regards to the uh, borrowing of money or the loaning of money to schools. Do we have a policy in place, procedure in place in regards to this? Because this is, I know schools have come to the board for money in the past, but I'm just wondering, what are their parameters here? Uh, through you, Chair. Yes. There is a, a procedure um, in place, so schools can borrow up to 25% of their budget. And the way it works is that uh, then they have a, a loan payment and it's usually over four to five years. And uh, every, at budget time, the loan payment is actually deducted, deducted from their budget amount for that year. Did that answer your question, Trustee Swan? Well, I have a secondary there. Go ahead. Is this usually just done through the um, the principal, or is this usually done in conjunction with the um, parent councils when, when they want to take out a loan for, let's say, um, IT, like to buy um, smart boards or something? I'm not sure on that one. Sorry. Well, I think uh, Mr. Coombs might want to get in here, but um, I, for some of the loan initiatives, uh, they're very significant projects, and there is often dialogue with the school councils um, with regard to, you know, oh, there is a mechanism within the board where we can borrow some money to put toward this major project. Um, so I would say that uh, that from that point of view, there would be uh, certainly uh, collaboration with, with the school councils. But it's, it's the principal's job to seek the loan uh, and it's senior administration's job to approve the loan. Mm -hmm. Mr. Coombs, did you want to 
I didn't think of that. Very well said. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Trustee, Trustee Bill McPherson. Um, not a question, just a suggestion. Uh, a few years ago, uh, it was probably in the previous term, in a previous superintendent of the business, uh, we received a very excellent presentation on how school budgets are set. Uh, maybe that's something we can post on our web page that when you get a parent that's asking what the process is, and it outlined it quite nicely, and I realize we've had some updates, it's a different process now, but make that information available to the public that they can say, well, there's 118 kids in our school, and this is how it works. Trustee mm -hmm. McAllister. One of the challenging variables for schools is the cost of occasional teachers and I'm wondering why that cost cannot be centrally funded mm -hmm. as opposed to a split between the, some fund here at the board and the school budget it would seem is there a reason for that why it's not done that way for you chair mm -hmm. um, a lot of schools mention that because it is definitely a challenge to manage that. But I think what happens is if it's not at the school level, it's really difficult to manage it then if you just have all those costs in one account, then it's all central and there's not really anybody specific managing it. Whereas when it's in the school budget, the principal can see, the funds can you know, know what's behind the costs and uh, you know, make any decisions based on that. Just to, to continue that, the um, perhaps the formula has changed um, since my days, but um, I believe that uh, it was calculated that it's a, approximately eight days uh, per per teacher per staff member uh, that is put into the budgets in order to um, assist. Uh, the uh, principal in uh, paying for the first, uh, say, five days of occasional teacher costs. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, after that, uh, it becomes a central, it's incurred central, the cost is incurred centrally. So the principals, the school budget pays for the first five days uh, and of absence, uh, of continuous absence. And then the, um, uh, the, the central budget picks up, uh, picks up the rest of it. Okay. Trusty Cartner. Um, oh my, here comes the senior moment. Um, what, so you're telling us the occasional costs are the most tricky ones to control as far as a principal goes. Um, yes. And I understand that, um, but I I wonder is PD paid out of that mm -hmm. occasional teacher cost, or is that a central account, or is it? I know a lot of things are covered by the uh, central office, but is it all covered by central office as far as professional development? Through you, Chair, it, it depends on the item. Some things are charged centrally, so, um, so for example, maybe uh, Teaching for Learning may decide to do some PD for teachers, and then they would charge it to a central code. Or maybe the principal, as part of the school success plan, may decide that they want to pay for some teachers to do some PD, so then it would be charged to that school budget. Yep. Mr. Chair, may I, could I just add to that? You certainly can. When the budget is developed for occasional teachers, and Director Patterson referred to the, the eight days, that portion of the school budget allocation is really intended for those short leave Mm -hmm. sick day replacements, the PD part does not come into that calculation because the eight days is based on the actual experience in the Upper Canada Board and that's what's used. Certainly, as Tracy said, out of the total school budget allocation, and by the way, the schools receive a, a total allocation. We don't say how much has to go to supply teachers. There's a calculation of a supply teacher component, but principals have uh, the uh, leeway to allocate uh, as as they see fit. So out of that total pot, certainly 
uh, principals may add more to supply teacher their supply teacher budget within the school for shift more in that direction or they could also allocate some for PD uh, as well for supply teachers for PD purposes okay Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. McDonald, you go ahead first. Well, no, if there's somebody else in the queue, that's all. I just wanted no, to get in. No, a... you're, you're up. Well, I think Superintendent Barkley covered it, and, and I just wanted to speak to um, the points that Trustee McAllister and Trustee Karkner raised. It, just historically, trustees at, at a time decided that <clears throat> we would allocate more money into school budgets to allow for principals to have um, the autonomy to, um, to have the funds in their school and, and uh, use the money as they see fit and if if they were able to offset costs uh, associated to, to sick time in different ways than and not cover it through the budget then then that's what they were able to do so if it's creating i guess we need to know if it is creating uh, issues across the system then we need to revisit that um but i i like the idea of having uh, allowing principals to have the autonomy to to uh, use the funds they need within a school to be able to operate it in their um, in their communities, and that it at that time it was um, before we did it, it was very structured. Certain things would uh, would come into the budget, and it was um, put into almost envelopes, similar to what the ministry does. So I, I like to to continue that format, but if there's a something that's broken in it, maybe we need to uh, re-examine. Thank you, Trustee McDonald. Trustee Swan, you had a comment you wanted to make or a question? Yes, this is relatively new to me, but I just wanted to know, if you have a very strong parent council with very large fundraising um, in a school, is that does that impact on the school's budget? Well, through you, Chair. Yeah, all right. um, really, the two are separate, but the only thing I can say to that is that you know, if you have a school um, that doesn't have a very generous school-generated funds account, then they may have to charge uh, like a field trip cost to their school budget. Mm -hmm. So having the fundraising efforts there really helps to have uh, money to offset. Let me add, Mr. Chair, but in the calculation of the school budget, mm -hmm. uh, we do not take into consideration how much that school has in school-generated mm -hmm. funds. They're two separate items okay. any more comments questions we've been a very good discussion I, I thank you so much if I if I'm sorry if I, if I may yes go ahead oh, thank you sorry for being late on that no problem um if we just took going back to uh, my fellow counselor Bill McPherson uh, with regards to having some of uh, the information that uh, would help uh, parents with the understanding of how the school budgets come around um, and having that up on a website that we can point and direct parents to go to for more information on it uh, without bothering their principals or what have you to learn a little bit before they even go to their principals and ask how, how things are going. Uh, is that at all possible? And if he was going to make that motion, I would second it. I would have that up on the uh, Upper Canada's website. Uh, okay. I, I, I th certainly understand what you're saying. I don't think it was brought forward or, or an interest in terms of a motion. I think you were just reflecting on the past practices and that it hadn't been there before. Oh, I see. Sorry, I misunderstood. It was done okay. before, and my suggestion was is that yeah. simply to redo it. Yeah. And so it's just to, to Nancy taking notes. So yeah. Okay. So I don't think it needs to come forward in, in terms of the motion. It's just a okay. Revisiting what <clears throat> had been there, but we certainly a good point. Uh, Thank you. Both. Thank you. Any more comments? Questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Moving on to 6.03, I'm going to turn the floor over to Superintendent of School Operations, David Coombs, who's going to talk about concussion policy. That's a lovely picture. Yeah, that's relaxing. I hate to replace that picture, Mr. Chair. Um, don't then. <laughs> this is for our wellness part. That's the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, good evening, trustees. Um, I'm here to uh, present a system operations uh, policy on concussions. Um, this is uh, follows the policy and program memorandum 158 from the ministry, requiring boards to have uh, a policy regarding the um, uh, uh, dealing uh, with uh, concussions. Uh, I'd like to start out 
Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Um, so I'd, I'd like to, to point out just a couple of things regarding the policy before I uh, go into more detail of what it means from a second level. <laughs> Um, I think first and foremost, the policy recognizes uh, that uh, children and adolescents are actually at greater risk uh, for concussions and there's pot potential for um, uh, prolonged symptoms and recovery from symptoms, um, uh, even more so than, uh, than many adults. Uh, and that th these kind of uh, injuries can take place at any time, uh, not just in contact sports. And, and I'd like to say, I, I think we've been doing a very good job going back a few years now, um, where coaches have a much greater awareness of the kind of uh, effect of concussions in some of our contact sports at the high school level. So football, rugby, uh, soccer, uh, certainly hockey, um, and a lot of uh, recreational associations, again, have done a very good job of promoting concussion awareness. Um, what I think has been missing uh, until recently is also the understanding of the cognitive effects of a concussion and the fact that you not only have to take your time to ease a child back into play, but you also have to ease a child back into learning. Uh, and it's that cognitive recovery uh, which I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about. Uh, this policy um, encompasses both awareness of uh, the seriousness of concussions, uh, the, uh, how to identify uh, concussions, and also how to manage concussions once we, once we know that a concussion has taken place. Uh, and um, I will say that although this is four statements in a policy, uh, these procedures are now our longest procedure, uh, eclipsing our safe school and student discipline policies. So there are uh, a lot of procedures that are associated with this. So you, uh, you may all re uh, already be aware, um, a concussion is a brain injury. Uh, and it has to be treated as such. Uh, and it can um, happen at any time. It can happen in the play, playing field. It can happen in the playground. It can happen in a hallway. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a blow to the head. It could be just a trauma to the body, which causes the brain to shift inside the skull. Uh, and in fact, um, oftentimes we think concussions uh, are associated with a lack of conscious or a loss of consciousness. In fact, most concussions are associated with no loss of consciousness. So um, a big part of this policy will be associated with procedures. And again, as I mentioned before, uh, the awareness campaign will be very important. And we've already begun that. And uh, Dr. Paula Stewart was here talking a little bit about our partnership with the, uh, uh, with the health units in assisting us in this. Um, obviously, there's going to be awareness training for our teachers, our principals, our vice principals. But also important will be the other uh, employees of our board, so EAs, office administrators. Uh, supervisory monitors, volunteers, bus drivers, um, all will have to have some kind of um, uh, training in, uh, uh, in the procedure of concussion awareness. Um, uh, also, uh, there are strategies in this procedure regarding um, assessing a child that's uh, undergone a uh, particular um, um, uh, injury, um, and also the managing of returning that child to the classroom and to the playing field. Very important to notice, um, to, uh, to mention, um, that when we talk about return to learn, we are talking about individualized programs for each child. Very important distinction. Um, because uh, concussions can be completely different uh, um, depending upon uh, many different factors, um, you have to consider the child as an individual. So accommodation plans, which we are quite good at in ed education, have to be drawn up and they will look different uh, with different timelines for every child. Every concussion is different, every child is different. Most important to this procedure will be ongoing training, regular ongoing uh, to everybody both coming into our schools as well as reminders on an ongoing basis. And I'll talk a little bit about some of our accountability checks uh, in this, uh, implementing this, uh, uh, this policy. So this is an example uh, of an appendix from our um, uh, from our procedure. Uh, this would be something, and I apologize for the Rick Gales font here, uh, <laughs> but uh, this is something which we would uh, provide in the laminated card uh, to, um, uh, to coaches and to teachers and to uh, playground uh, supervisors. So they would be able to tell um, that if a child has fallen down and they get up, that there are some definite signs that they should be looking for. 
Um, and these are not just physical signs. And sometimes we think concussion, again, we think of those physical kind of signs. But you can also see emotional and behavioral results from concussions. Uh, and this is really important when you, uh, as we talk about reintegrating students back into the classroom. Uh, I mentioned the return to learn strategies. Uh, and this is an example from, again, another appendix. Um, uh, what you may see when a child has, uh, has suffered a concussion is that behaviorally they will act differently. So um, uh, where a child may have been uh, very free-spirited, uh, gets along with everybody, uh, very outgoing and boisterous, will be quiet, maybe have their head down on their desk, um, maybe irritable and may lash out a little bit in an in a, uh, in a uncom in a, um, uncharacteristic way. These are perfectly normal reactions and recovery symptoms to concussions. And that's why an accommodation plan has to be put in place to account for some of these post-concussion symptoms. So the important part here of this procedure is communication. Um, many times, uh, because this procedure is in effect, um, uh, if a student is impacted or uh, injured on our school property or on a school event, but also many concussions happen on a weekend, a Saturday afternoon at a soccer game. They've uh, had a concussion, uh, they go home, perhaps they haven't been diagnosed and they show up for school on Monday morning. Uh, and so this is really important that there is great dialogue between parents and uh, school staff and healthcare professionals. Uh, so that there is an understanding of how we can work together to support that child coming back. Um, uh, part of this, uh, and uh, Dr. Stewart and I were chatting a little earlier in the week, um, they are really assisting us in reaching out to medical professionals mm -hmm. to say that if a child, if you are treating a child uh, who has had a concussion, there is a necessity to provide that information to the school. So the school can then uh, build an accommodation plan that's appropriate for that child. Um, there's a reporting procedure in this, and this is part of our accountability checks. So uh, biannually, um, the middle of the year and the end of the year, schools will be um, required to submit a, a student concussion diagnosis report. This is an example of that form. Um, so students will be submitting it to my office. I will be collecting the data and submitting that data to the Ministry of Education. Part of that, and it's not shown on this form, um, is that there is a, um, a required um, uh, training component with staff that has to be outlined in this form. So this is another accountability check to make sure that this is being regularly reviewed with staff, with volunteers, and with other um, uh, stakeholders within the community. Um, I've contacted Stao and I've uh, talked to Ron Cottenham. Um, so for example, um, he will be assisting me in providing uh, some basic awareness training uh, for bus drivers. That's an example of what we, uh, uh, of how this is going to roll forward. Uh, I'm going to show a, a short video. Um, this is Charles, uh, Dr. Charles Tater. He is a neurosurgeon from, um, uh, I believe it's Sick Kids in Toronto, uh, and he would be considered a um, um, certainly a North American expert in uh, adolescent and child brain trauma. This is a very short video about the importance of schools and health professionals working together. Hi, I'm Dr. Charles Tater. I'm a brain surgeon. I work at the Toronto. Western Hospital. It's very important for kids, teachers, and parents to know a lot about concussions because concussions occur frequently uh, in children and adolescents, and there is the opportunity to diagnose them early and treat them properly and get kids back to school and back to activity. Well, we have learned from dealing with kids and adolescents who have had concussions that it's very important to reintroduce both mental activities and physical activities on a graduated basis. And this comes from medical conferences that are held uh, every three or four years among the experts. And the experts tell us that we ought to be more aware of the return to learn process, that it is extremely important to reintroduce kids to 
learning and cognitive activities on a graduated basis, the same as we have done for the last several years with return to activity, that physical activities have to be reintroduced slowly in order to make sure that recovery is going to be optimal. So with return to activity like sports, it's much easier. We've been able to develop a six step process and define each of those steps, like how quickly you can run and whether you should go back to contact sports. Uh, that's been easy. M much more difficult is the return to learn process. And we are now aware that it has to be individualized. In other words, we can't prescribe exactly what those steps are. It has to be geared towards each kid. Each kid is different. In fact, every kid with concussions that I've seen in my office is a little bit different from, from the previous one. No two are alike. And that's what we've learned with Return to Learn, that it has to be gradual and it has to be based on what that particular kid can tolerate. So at the beginning, for example, we may only have a kid in school for uh, a, a few hours or even a half day and then we can progress to a full day based on that kid's demonstrated tolerance. So if going to school for two hours intensifies headaches, for example, then we should cut back to one hour. Or we may need to have softer lighting or a less noisy environment. So these, in educational terms, are accommodations. And many of these kids do require that type of accommodation during the return to learn process. We don't need to wait until all the symptoms are gone from concussion because with some kids they are going to be waiting a long time. What we have learned is that kids should return based on what they can tolerate. And they don't have to be completely better when they start the return to learn process. Um, for example, an hour a day may be what can be tolerated or a half day. So that's what we mean by individualizing the return to learn process. You know, it's very difficult to say what is the expectation for how long it's going to take a given kid to recover. Some recover within a few days and after a week, they don't even know they had a concussion. And unfortunately, others can take months to recover. And so it has to be individualized. And what we've learned, in fact, is that if you go stepwise on the basis of that kid's response to a graduated reintroduction, that's when you get the best recovery. individualized accommodation for students who have, uh, who have concussions. Uh, what's next steps for us? Uh, we'll be increased training for our administrators uh, starting, uh, gosh, next week. Um, and uh, that video will be going out and be shown at school councils as well as our parent involvement committee. Uh, we're actually producing, we have a, a committee of, um, of principals and vice principals who are assisting in uh, developing training materials. Um, and we're going to be developing uh, videos with actual students who have suffered concussions and have recovered from concussions. Uh, we think that'll be very ad advantageous both for teachers, so they get the student perspective of what it's like to come back to school when you've had a concussion, but also for parents and increasing their awareness of how to deal with uh, a student who uh, may have had a brain trauma. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Superintendent Coons. Trustee Graham and Trustee McPherson. Mr. Chair, uh, my concern is who makes the call right now, uh, because I could believe that 
Student's got a concussion, parent doesn't, doctor does. Doctor doesn't believe the student should be back, parent does. Um, I don't think the student should be, or I think the student should be. So that's my concern on this is who makes what call. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. That's a great question, um, and it's actually one that's been repeated to me by administrators. I'm not a healthcare professional. Um, I, I can't make that call. They're not. Uh, we're not asking any of our staff members to be healthcare professionals and to diagnose. That's only for a medical professional. Um, and in part of our procedure, there is a medical documentation which is required by uh, doctors to fill out and complete and provide to the school, provide to the parent who then provides it to the school to determine what the next steps are. Um, the important part of this is that if a child has um, uh, had a, um, uh, has had a, uh, either falls down, hits their head, seems a little bit woozy, that it's not just another, it's something that needs to be taken seriously, reported forward uh, and brought to the attention of the uh, school administration as well as the, uh, uh, at the parents so that there can be that um, uh, that uh, medical intervention. Um, I, I think um, in, in talking with Dr. Stewart earlier, um, there is a much better awareness on the behalf on um, uh, medical practitioners about childhood concussions um, and that symptoms can actually manifest themselves 48, 72 hours after there have been an actual uh, blow to the head. Um, and I think if teachers are more aware of the symptoms and some of the things that they could see, then their job is to simply bring that forward and say, I see something different in this child that needs to be followed up. But you're quite right. The expectation is not that our teachers or our principals act as medical practitioners and make a diagnosis, only that they, um, uh, number one, refer on, and number two, when there has been a diagnosis of concussion, provide the, uh, the appropriate accommodations. You want to follow up to that? Yes, Go ahead. So would that mean that the medical pr practitioner is diagnosing A, the concussion to start with, and B, also telling you when the program should start for uh, formal education back again? That's through you, Mr. Chair. That's um, that's correct. Uh, in that they would they would be able to say this is phase one, phase two, phase three of the recovery. So, for example, if I if if I may, the first phase of a recovery is the student might be in there for an hour or two, but clear desk, clear desk for that day. And then if that has if a good day has happened, then we can consider the second day, which might be a little bit of interaction. Um, Thank you, Trustee McPherson. Uh, following up along the same lines as I go over this list of signs and symptoms uh, most of them will occur when you turn 65 but <laughs> um, is there a do not pass go limit like a student injures himself uh, hits their head against the gymnasium wall gets up and says I'm fine and then staggers to the change room when I look at this list, if you check a single one of those off, you then turn that student into the hands of medical professionals, even if they give them a clean bill of health. So there is a do not pass go associated with this list. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, yes, we refer to that as that when in doubt, pull them out. Uh, and that's the, um, uh, if there's any kind of, an, and uh, those of us that uh, are, uh, perhaps of a different generation that played perhaps some contact sports it was called getting your bell rung and as soon as you saw the proper number of fingers you went back in and on the on the field um, and there was a bit of tough it out and uh, you know uh, uh, you know be a man that kind of thing I think there is much greater understanding both in the sports field as um, uh, that uh, that we don't take chances with a brain injury uh, and that if you have any doubts um, then you refer on uh, and that we make sure, and that and I mentioned that slide on communication, it's critical in this process. Um, and not just with parent, but also uh, with medical practitioners as well. Okay. Trustee Gardner. I'm really pleased to see that this is extended into the community as far as the education part of it, according to your chart. I think that's going to um, put Upper Canada in a good light. And uh, also, we have many uh, volunteers who work with our, our children and uh, if they're part of that training, then we're all on the same page. That's good. Correct. Thank you. Yes. Any other comments, questions? Anyone on phone lines? It's Trustee McDonald. Go ahead, Trustee McDonald. Uh, Superintendent Coons, this 
this really relates to incidents that occur in the school um, or s field trips, I guess, would be included. But what happens whenever there's a, I mean, a lot of our students are active outside of school. Is there anything that requires the um, reporting to a school of an incident if a, if a medical practitioner has um, seen a child for incident outside of school? Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, it does encompass that. Um, uh, thank you for for uh, for raising that, Trustee McDonald. Um, and, uh, many many concussions actually do take place during recreational activities on the you know in the evening or on on weekends. Um, that's why the importance of this is to get out to um, to the parent how important it is that if your child has suffered a kind of uh, uh, either a concussion or a suspected concussion. Uh, that number that a you bring them to a uh, uh, to be um, uh, to be checked out, uh, but b that you inform the school, and the school then uh, puts their procedure in place, um, and and uh, that that's part of the training. Uh, that's not just training for our administrators. That's also training or um, uh, part of our communication communication plan to get that out to uh, uh, to parents. We have a number of different tactics for that. Um, we've talked about media releases, certainly using our school councils, newsletters. Uh, uh, the health units are assisting us in that already. Um, and it's also going out uh, um, to, um, uh, uh, to community recreational organizations like minor league hockey uh, and partnering up with them as well. Um, the, the, and I'm, I'm very glad that there was, um, that Dr. Stewart was here earlier today because this really is part of a healthy, healthy community partnership. Uh, and um, and uh, moving this forward. So, thank you. Trustee McAllister. Just a comment. This is a great concern to uh, to all parents, and I'm really pleased to see that it's going to be brought to the school councils as an agenda item. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, yeah. comments? Okay. I have a motion that the Committee of the Whole recommend the Upper Canada District School Board create concussion policy 4002 as submitted to the Committee of the Whole January 28, 2015. Do we have a mover? Trustee McAllister, Trustee Kartner, and I ask you to cast your votes, please. person is not in the room. I'm in favor. It's not coming up for me. Thank you, Trustee Swa. That carries. Thank you very much. Hmm? I'm oh, but Trustee yeah. McPherson, we were just voting on the, uh, the motion to um, recommend the Upper Canada create a concussion policy 4002 as submitted by committee poll. Mm -hmm. In favor? Yeah. Thank you so much. Sorry. No problem. Thank you. Okay, moving ahead, uh, we're going to turn it over to our leader in uh, policy review, Trustee John McAllister. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as I said before, we've identified 17 policies that are in need of uh, review. We have uh, reviewed seven, and we have three tonight, so I, in turn, am going to turn it over to Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, in the review of these uh, policies, we've uh, taken the action recommended to uh, consolidate uh, communications policy 300 and 310, and in doing so have uh, maintained the basic intent of those policies but reduced the language. Um, we've also recommended um, social media policy 301, which is unchanged from its current format, but we've uh, taken the opportunity to review that policy and keep it in its current state. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, go back to the first policy. This is communication policy uh, 300. And if everyone has that in front of them. Let's see what the changes are. Now this was the um, Going to be combining these. Are there any questions at all in terms of the? Um, I'm going to come back to it. Just taking uh, the uh, recommendation of 
Oh, we'll see 300 and 301 combining those. No, that's 301. <coughs> 300 and 310? Nope, that's not it either. It's right here. It's up on the screen. Is that on the screen? Sorry. Okay, any questions in current turning? Is this the one you're highlighting? It's number one. Then. Number one. Uh, any questions concerning the uh, combined policy 300 communication with policy 310 media as submitted by the committee of the board? Trustee McPherson. Um, okay, the second paragraph. Is this now, 300? Chair of the board and the director of education, da 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 da. Are the board's primary spokesmen in all situations where a system level response is required. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, I am assuming that the focus here is on primary and system level. So, that if an individual trustee gets a call from the local paper about uh, um, proposed school consolidation or something like that, we're still free to answer we're still free to do local media re-inquiries let's put it that way mm -hmm. yeah because i'm focusing on primary and system level yeah, yeah. Okay. exactly okay. but sometimes that can be a, a fine line oh i know I and, and i think that if there's any I mean, we have to at some point very sit down when we end up with these kind of situations and clearly define where that line is because it's, it's important i think when we're dealing with primary issues that uh, there are two spokesmen for the board at that point in time. But I, I certainly agree with you in terms of uh, your response at the local level. If I think I'm going to kick the beehive over, I'll give you a call. I might want to try that. <laughs> and a secondary? Pardon me? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, and I'm on the next line. Um, you provide comments, and the director does, um, from a political perspective. And I guess I have a bit of problems with the word political perspective because all of us on the board probably have different political perspectives in regards to the running of the board. And I'm just a bit uncomfortable with that word in there. Well, I think that when they're talking about political perspective, I think they're, they're talking about issues and situations that have uh, political repercussions, um, implications that are politically um, in, involve a political response as opposed to uh, my my personal political views or someone else's. I think it's it's looking at a situation and is this situation one that requires a um, a response that is would would be politically motivated in terms of its implications. Does that that make the distinction? We're not talking about my and me. Let's say me in particular. Not, not we're not talking about my political views. We're talking about a situation that is politically. Um, Sort of governance. Well, that's right. When we're looking at governance, we're looking at the that's a, a political uh, animal in itself. So, anything that's dealing with governance, we would we would uh, be giving a response. So, could we use the word governance perspective instead of political? Just as suggested. I just don't like that word. <laughs> Comments? Questions? Anyone opposed? To it? Uh, Mr. Chair, can I just? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, there, Trustee McConnell. Were you know, like falling out of a chair? What were you doing there? <laughs> go ahead. I thought you were going to go without me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Go ahead. Well, I, I certainly understand where uh, Trustee Swan's coming from, and there is a distinction for uh, the chair, hey, obviously on the governance side of things as well, but. There are uh, are items that you need to respond to that are um, politically motivated across the province as a result of um, funding formulas, uh, GSN type things, as a result of different announcements that come out from the province. You, you have the ability, you are the spokesperson for the board on all of those matters, not just on uh, the governance of the day-to-day -day, uh, operations of the board. and. Um, Obviously, the, the director has a, sorry, not operations, but the governance side of things. The, the director has an opportunity to speak on operations, but there, we need to have, allow the chair to have the latitude to be able to speak um, 
on behalf of the board and the impacts it may have on the board as a result of something that may be coming down the uh, the road. So if we, if we zero it into governance only, we're we're just, in my view, tying the hands of the chair. Or yeah, the chair. Trustee Swan, you, you okay with that? Thank you. So then we will leave it as it is. Any other comments? So let, let's take that motion first, that the Committee of the Whole recommend the Upper Canada District School Board combine Policy 300 uh, communications with Policy 310 media as submitted to the Committee of the Whole January 28, 2015. I need a mover. Moved by. Trustee Bill McPherson, seconded by Trustee Richards. And cast your vote, please. The that Trustee Cram. I didn't come up this time. So Any in favor? Yeah. And Trustee uh, Trustee Wendy, Mc, Wendy McPherson is opposed. Oh, Everyone else in favor? <laughs> Trustee Swan, favor opposed. Opposed. Uh, carries. The uh, second motion uh, deals with the um, retiring policy 310 media. Uh, can we have just a little bit more discussion on that just to make sure we're all very clear on what that is? Uh, 1999. Uh, Superintendent Dawes, you, can you just quickly address that so we're very clear on what we're, the motion is? Certainly, Chair. Um, this Social media policy 301 was actually developed several years ago. It uh, involved considerable um, work uh, through a, a policy team that was put together. Um, in reviewing this policy, it was um, determined that it met the intentions of the board under its current wording. So we're simply suggesting that we keep it as is and uh, bring it forward for review date uh, in, t in 20, excuse me, three years from now, I believe. It's policy 301. Oh, yes, 310, sorry. Yeah, 310. Oh, I'm sorry. But thanks for that on 301. We'll keep okay, that in so mind. Three that <laughs> Let's go back to 310. Uh, that, that's the media. Yeah, again, Chair, um, the point on this, we felt that the uh, language in this particular part of the policy would be contained within the new structure of uh, policy uh, 300, as it's worded now, and you just reviewed. Thank you very much. Uh, Trustee McAllister, anything you want to add on this? this no. Meeting this? I'm satisfied with that. Okay. All right, so motion two. The, the Committee of the Whole recommend the Upper Canada District School Board retire policy 310 media. Moved by Trustee McAllister, seconded by Trustee Cram. I'll ask you to cast your votes on that, please. And Mr. Carter. <coughs> All in favor, thank you so much. And thank you, Superintendent Oz, for telling us about policy 301. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any questions or comments on that? Seeing there are none, I uh, have a motion that the Committee of the Whole recommend the Upper Canada District School Board um, document policy 301, social media. document policy with a review date of January 28, 2015. Moved by Trustee Kartner, Trustee Richards. I ask you to cast your votes, please. And that carries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, McAllister, uh, Trustee McAllister. Okay, I need a motion to move the committee of whole back into the regular board meeting, January 14th, moved by Trustee McPherson, Trustee Kartner. Cast your votes, please. And that carries. Thank you so much. A report from private session, uh, January 14th, 2015. There was one contractual matter was discussed and no recommendation 
was brought forward to the board. Report from the Committee of the Whole, public session January the 14th. There were three presentations and two discussion items um, that were brought forward to the Committee of the Whole, and the following recommendations were brought forward to the board. Motion, the first motion is that the Upper Canada District uh, School Board update policy 235, alcohol and substance use, and revision as submitted to the Committee of the Whole January 14th. 2015. I need a mover. Trustee McAllister. <laughs> Trustee Carter. Any comments or questions on that? No, there there are none. I'll ask you to cast your votes. And that carries. Thank you very much. The uh, next motion, the Upper Canada District School Board Update Policy 432, Videos Security Surveillance Property with Revisions as Submitted at, to the Committee of the Whole, January 14, 2015. That's moved by Trustee McPherson, seconded by Trustee Cram. Any comments or questions on that? Thank you. Please cast your votes. And that carries. Moving on to the next item, I'm going to turn uh, the SEAC Special Ed Education Advisory Committee over to the Chair of SEAC, Trustee McPherson. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, we met on the 6th of January in the boardroom here. Uh, we actually did two meetings in one night. Uh, we held our organizational meeting first, and we started with a round of introductions around the table, and there was a lot of people around the table that night, including our chair, Mr. McMillan, and thank you for coming out. You're welcome. Um, then we went into the elections for the SEAC chair and the vice chair, and uh, I was elected for chair for the coming year as SEAC, and Kimberly Wright from the Brockville District Association for Community Involvement was elected for SEAC Vice Chair. Um, then we moved into meeting number two. Oh, first off, I must mention that we brought several new members onto our committee. Uh, Kevin Bryson, or Brisson, from Cornwall. Shelley Graham from the large city of Balderson in Lanark County and uh, Wendy McPherson, the trustee from Glengarry County, came on as the alternate for the trustee position. Meeting number two is essentially was a uh, orientation session on the roles and duties of the SEAC committee. Uh, the purpose of this was to define the composition term and role of SEAC, discuss effective practices for SEAC, and become aware of the policies and legislation pertaining to special education as well as become aware of the source of information to assist you in fulfilling your role. Um, we're also looking at topics for upcoming and future SEAC agendas. In fact, next week we're going to have a planning session as part of our meeting. I'll remind that we're open. Any of the trustees that want to drop in, feel free to drop in. Uh, Valerie did give us a report on the following items. Chris Hawthorne has been appointed principal of student engagement, replacing John Lalonde, who is retired in December. And we also were made aware of an I Coach and You Can Too conference and training session for teachers and staff conducted by students was being held at PDCI, which is in the heart of beautiful Lanark County. At, uh, this has grade 11 students working with grade 9 students creatively integrate iPad use in the classroom to meet curriculum per expectations. And then we adjourned and like I said we meet again on the 3rd of February right here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any comments or questions to Chair McPherson? And our none, thank you very much. Uh, report from OPSPA. Director David McDonald, are you there? I am here. Are you ready for a report or are you okay? 
Uh, well, I'll just give you a quick update. Uh, today I was at uh, Office of Executive Council, so as a Board of Directors, we don't meet again until uh, the 20th and 21st of February. But I uh, just wanted to give you a quick update today. There's not a lot happening with the government. The government uh, is, uh, is still out. They rose on the, I think it was the 11th of December, and they're not back until February. Um, there is correspondence that, if, uh, that we get from time to time, and um, a lot of boards send to uh, to OPSPA. One of the uh, pieces of correspondence that was shared with us today was from uh, the Halton District School Board, uh, and it, it's a letter dated or um, sent to the ministry <clears throat> about the um, reduction of the high needs uh, special education uh, grant. So we, we started to, to hear some information about that previously, but it is going to be a tremendous impact for um, for most boards across the province, um, except for Peel. But uh, uh, in any event, it's going to impact us, and we um, I can share this this letter with uh, trustees. But I think it's something that we need to address and, and start to have some discussions on about um, the planning and, and how it's going to impact us as a board. The um, the other items that we discussed. Uh, I previously gave a report on the pupil accommodation review guideline that uh, the ministry had released. And it was just a consultation type paper that uh, was released at that time. But um, it, it sounds like and looks like that that guide that they've produced is, uh, is going to be uh, um, become solidified and, and sent out to, uh, to boards. It's not being put into uh, any legislation or regulations at this point. It's going to be a guideline for uh, boards to, um, to implement. But it's the minimum requirements. I mean, obviously, if we wanted to to do something for an extended period, we could do that. But um, that'll be moving forward. Uh, also, also an update on the school transportation procurement review. The there was an expert panel that was um, put forward, and there's additional time being given to that panel uh, to review um, for consultation purposes. The GSN review or brief um, from the um, executive it's outlined in our regular key, key works uh, was provided to the ministry in December and um, we did receive some concerns I know that we have some uh, updates coming forward or some some training coming forward for the audit committees uh, there were a number of concerns from uh, the north that um, they were expected to drive six to seven hours uh, for a two-hour training session and then some boards are told that it's only a, um, a webinar type session. So a little confusion and uh, ops to staff are going to look into that and send some information out. Um, I think that's about it as far as the information that I can. Oh, the other piece that I did want to share is that uh, ops to board of directors uh, will have uh, many new faces um, in, on the 20th. There's 17 new appointments from boards to the board of directors. Um, as a result of election process and uh, and new boards uh, appointing or board void boards appointing new uh, new members to the uh, board of directors, so that will be uh, an interesting uh, board of directors meeting on the 20th. Uh, Pez begins on officially on Friday or I guess Thursday evening. Tomorrow is the uh, uh, ministry directed uh, training, and um, on Saturday morning, bright and early, there is a regional meeting. Uh, where we only have about an hour to review some items, but um, it's open to all trustees. And um, you'll see on your information package when you get in the eastern region, I think, is in the uh, Kenora room, if I'm not mistaken. So I invite all trustees that are attending PES from Upper Canada to come to the regional meeting on Saturday morning. That's it, Chair. Thank you so much. Any questions or comments? Yes, a quick question, please. Yes, go ahead. Um, have you heard anything about the changes to the school closure policies? Because I received an email from um, one of my local mayors now, and um, it said they aren't going to take into account uh, community use of schools, this and that. And this came from the province to the uh, Association of Municipalities of Ontario, thus reaching our mayor. Has this come to Oslo yet? Yeah, that's the uh, one of the first points that I spoke about. It's the People Accommodation Review Guidelines. Okay. So there was a, a consultation that was completed um, and a PowerPoint that was shared. And I can certainly send that off to trustees, uh, that PowerPoint. I have a hard copy, but I'll make sure that I can get a soft copy and send it off to trustees. 
um, and, it, and it basically does change the um, the scope a lot. Uh, it does well. It doesn't change the scope. It changes the rules a little bit. Uh, it makes it easier to deal with some um, some particular uh, schools that are um, very low in enrollment. Those types of things. So uh, it, it, it I guess it's it's more in favor for uh, boards to be able to march through a process. But it really identifies from a ministry standpoint and the government standpoint um, that they want to ensure that the funds that are being pushed out from the ministry are being utilized on um, on schools that are not not empty and so they want to make sure that the money is going in into schools that are are uh, are full or at least at near capacity so it's really in my opinion hurting rural schools well trustee swan what what i plan on doing i don't want to get into a discussion about this right <laughs> now but what i plan on doing is when this information is clearly available to us of having an information session for all of our trustees and sitting down with uh, people who are, are well versed in this so uh, all of the trustees know exactly what this is uh, all about and know exactly what the the process uh, involves so i want to make the opportunity for all of us to come together and have a clear understanding what this is all about and i think at that point we can talk about some other things i totally welcome that and thank you very much you're welcome Okay, any other questions, comments? Okay, Director. I have no comments. I can't believe that. <laughs> it's a gift. I, I have just a few. Um, the first thing I want to do is, I can't believe I'm doing this, because I know that you started teaching the year after me, and I didn't know anyone taught this long. I have a pen that for 35 years of service, and I know you've been there longer than that. So on behalf of the board, we'd like to thank oh you very goodness. much for 35 very plus much. years of yes, service. Thank you. You're very welcome. I didn't stick around long enough to get one of those because you're... Well, <laughs> neither did I until I came back. <laughs> thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, just a, a couple comments. Um, trustees, we have got to get our picture taken. I know this sounds like a petty little point, but we're, we've, we've been in this role now for two months, and there are still some blank pictures on there. And if you, like that's how, if you think that's how you look, that's okay with me. But I think we really need to up-to-date that. And if you'll notice, we've got pictures at the back of, of the board. And um, we can superimpose a, a couple if you're not here but we really can't superimpose seven or eight of you. So I would really like you to make every effort, and that is next February the 11th. So uh, the, uh, my, the vice chair, uh, Perkner, said if she's getting her hair done for that night and it doesn't happen, she's charging the board. <laughs> so uh, another thing that um, we, have had, we have in our bylaws that in February we are to have a planning session. We, or January, wasn't it? February. In February, we have not been able to do that simply because dates, and it looks to me like there's always going to be a conflict with dates. So what I'm going to propose to you right now, and I, and I don't want discussion on it, just I'm looking at March 6th and the 7th. That's a Friday night and a Saturday. Uh, and that's where we'll be able to get into some of these uh, information items, such as the, um, the process that was just discussed uh, with uh, Trustee Swan. Um, I'm looking at uh, not not in the past where we've been to Ganlock where we stay overnight, that kind of thing. Well, some of you will have to stay in town simply because it's the, it just makes sense. Uh, people like myself who drive down the road, I probably should go home. Uh, but we're looking at 6th and 7th. Now, I know that will be a conflict with some of you, but that we have to get it in. The bylaws are there, otherwise we're going to end up changing bylaws, and I don't want to get that. You know, I'll call my wife and tell her why I won't be there for her birthday. <laughs> I'm not going near that one, Bill. And uh, the last one is uh, some of us will be in Toronto. We've got travel ahead of us, so I want everyone to be safe. And we will see you there tomorrow. And if not, if we, you know that we'll be thinking of you. And uh, I need a motion. The Upper Canada or the regular meeting of the public uh, session of Upper Canada District School Board be adjourned at 9:27 and 30 seconds. I'll make a motion. <laughs> that, who's that? No, Trustee Wendy McPherson. Trustee Wendy McPherson. <laughs> you got to start wearing this one. And Trustee Bill McPherson. All just hands up. All in favor? 
Thank you very much. Safe travels, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Did you get the time right there?